and this is probably going to trigger a few people listening in, is, oh, they said that this Carbonara 650, it's not. <laughs> yeah. It's fucking not. It's the, fucking chef, the chef behind is not weighing everything. <laughs> it, it might be when they did it in the, in the lab, putting all a all little bit of this, a little bit of that, but the chef back there is doing this. So let's be honest with ourselves. Let's increase that by 50%. That's what I always say. Let's increase it by 50 So if it says 650 on a chain restaurant, you're probably looking at more like 950, 1,000 calories. So, let's say, yeah. say if you're on 1,400 calories, by having an extra 400 calories, you're probably going to be in almost a similar deficit. I know people are looking at well, hang on a minute, because you're going to do more, your neat, the amount of neat calories that you're going to actually burn is going to be greater, and you're probably nearly going to make up that 400 calories just by day-to-day -day activities. Because and people eating out of Tupperware all the time, it's not going to happen for your everyday person. Don't get me wrong, for the 5% of people, it, you know, they want to have that focus, they want to go to that level. But don't get me wrong, just because you're eating ham sandwiches and spag bowls in the evening doesn't mean you can't get super, super lean. All right, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Today we're talking to Pete Styring. We're discussing weight loss and how to get lean. Uh, Pete is an online coach and personal trainer and the CEO and head coach of Program 10, which is a world-class 10-week body transformation program, which has helped thousands of people get amazing results. Welcome, Pete. Great to be here. Thanks, mate, Thanks for here, joining James. us. So the first question I want to ask, because I get this all the time, is can you out-train a bad diet? I, from clients, you get that, or from coaches. A bit of both, to be fair. <laughs> I think, yeah, I was going to yeah. say everyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Everyone. Um, yeah. Well, obviously, it depends. It depends on what you're consuming to consider as a bad diet. Um, obviously, people have different, you know, endpoints and start points of, of those in regards to calories, in regards to quality of calories as well. So that all is a depends answer. So I'm not going to say I'm not going to say to you like, no, you can't out train a bad diet. But what you can do is factor bad things into a diet and still get great and world class results. Yeah. Okay. And, and what tends to happen? Go on. <laughs> oh, I was going to say. So there's two there's two points there, I guess. So the first one to, to your to your question is, can you eat? anything you want train quite hard and that be enough what i would say in, in that respect is yes you will get results in terms of physical adaptation because you're training hard yeah. and you're probably over consuming calories so you're going to have calories to actually change your physique but in regards to getting good quality results on the scales in regards to dropping weight or um, seeing major progressions i would say no okay however some if you started to make small adjustments with the nutrition for example controlling someone's alcohol intake over the weekend you know by doing those little things that a coach can quite easily put into someone's protocols and say right okay instead of having you know 10 pints on a friday and saturday let's just drop that down to three or four because we know you love your booze mm -hmm. yeah you're you're gonna see results from that mm -hmm. okay and all of a sudden then we can start getting the client to understand the value of the quality of foods they're eating and also the poorer quality foods that they're eating and having and how that's having an effect not just on their physique but on their energy levels on their work performance on all these other things that are going to make them buy in more mm -hmm. rather than going oh i can't stick to that like if you said to someone mate you're not allowed to eat x y and z over the weekend like there's a highly likelihood that 95 percent of people ain't going to stick to that long term yeah. and that's what a dieting process whether they're dieting or maintaining uh, a certain look or physique or performance level, then that ha that has to be considered. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, you know, and obviously it depends on what niche you're talking about here. But the top sort of two three percent of people that are aiming to do bodybuilding shows and whatever else, yeah, they're gonna be able to stick to that process and protocols. But general life and mm -hmm. and normal human human beings, which you know, I know everybody's different, but you know what I'm saying about that. Yeah they ain't going to stick to that for long periods and what effect that has on the body when they finish that really harsh dieting process, as you guys know, as coaches, that has a major effect on, you know, physiology, psychology, you know, all these other things as well, that they're going to have a massive backlash yeah. from doing those sort of things. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> so a bit of a long winded answer, but it's not a simple question though, is it? That's the reality. No, of mate, it, the, so. the thing is, it's so, it is so long winded. It is, you know, it, there's so many different fucking factors in, in what you're asking. And I just don't think there's a real right answer. Yeah. That's the honest truth. I don't think there's a right answer. Like I've had clients before that, you know, they've, they've tried losing weight. 
they're training all the time and then you speak to them and then you talk to them about what they're eating and then they're training really hard going out going kfc on the wheel do you know what I mean? And so they're not understanding like yeah, 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 yeah. the calories in, calories out type of thing, you know, and they, yeah. they do believe that they can out train the diet. And, and then what tends to happen there is when they really do want to get start getting leaner, they start just taking everything out mm. and they go, right, okay, I'll just be really restrictive and I'm going to start eating. You know, when I, when I give, cl when I give clients on program 10, you know, calories outline their calories at the start of the course and I say, right, okay, for a female, I'm not saying all females, I'm just giving you examples here, but you're gonna, your starting calories are gonna be on 1850, 2000 calories, 2400 calories for you know, some, some people. Um, they shit their pants. Mm. They That's shit it. their pants because most of the dieting methods they've done have been 1200, 1400. And they think, oh, I'm not gonna lose weight on 1850, 2000. Yeah, you are. You are if you're consistent with that. And there's more highly likelihood that you're gonna be consistent with that because you can actually stick to it for long periods of time. You can actually fa factor these things in. You can potentially, I know you pro boys probably use this with your clients as well, is you can actually use banking methods of calories as well. So you can go lower in the week, say 16, 1700, where it's not that difficult to actually stick to. And then on weekends, a you've got a bit, a, splurge, more yeah, a bit of a splurge. Yeah. But yeah. like we've said before, flexibility still needs to be controlled because when we start eating KFC yeah. after training, yeah. calories are going to go through the roof. The other thing as well though, is, is if you start too low, there's nowhere to go. 100%. So if you start at 1,400 calories, yeah, you're going to have a big impact. You're going to lose weight. It's going to be hard to stick to, but some people can. Yep. They lose weight and then they hit that plateau. And then when they hit that plateau, what, there's nowhere to fucking yeah, go yeah. from that point. And then that's what they don't understand. Yeah. I do that with my, especially, especially new clients. I say to them, oh, we're going to start off quite high on your calories. And they're like, what? That's more than I'm normal. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, more yeah. than I eat now. And I'm like, but it's the quality of calorie. It's when you're eating, it's, it's yeah, uh, yeah. you know, et cetera. And then I say to them, as we taper, it's not like... It's, it, it, we got to keep going down. Yeah, you know, yeah. we got to keep moving. We got to keep going down, and then we will eventually hit a fairly low calorie point. Yeah, yeah. depending on but their goals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But again, that that might take a year. Yeah, yeah. Depending on how big they yeah, are, yeah. and where and also you want to keep. All, all, yeah, for, for sure, you want to keep all these tools. I, I call them tools, like with yeah. steps, cardio, training, calories. You want to keep all these tools in the back pocket and implement them when, when needed. You can, yeah, when needed, and also, as we know, like. Yes, you might you might get a client that will adhere to low calories for a certain amount of time because they're motivated. Yeah. Motivation comes and goes. So they're not going to stick to it when they're not motivated. And secondly, when they do plateau, they're going to sack it off straight away because it's too hard because they've got no motivation there. And also what people need to buy into with changing their physique and actually progressing their physique is actually having fuel available. Like you cannot train hard for a sustained period of time on 1,400 calories, on 1,200 calories. You know, you cannot do that. So your body, yes, you're going to lose weight. You're going to see numbers on the scales go down. But physically, and your physique will actually look worse. And obviously, long term, it'll look worse because you will you will go through the backlash afterwards. 100%. Yeah. That's always what happens. And like I said to you guys before we went live is, is I never talk to a client about how good a diet is when they're on it. Because when they're on it, they tend to be losing lots of weight. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'm doing Slimming World. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm on no carbs. I'm on cabbage diets or whatever. They lose a lot of weight on it. I always ask clients, how was that diet a month after you finished the diet? Mm -hmm. Like, have you actually kept most of the weight off? I'm not saying you should keep all the weight off because obviously, you know, you should go through phases. It's really weird you say that. One of my clients recently lost 10 stone. And the only reason I, we, we it was in the paper yesterday and stuff like that. But the only reason I didn't go to the paper sooner is because I, when he lost the 10 stone, we were, I wanted to stabilize his metabolism for a while. Yeah. So he lost that a few months ago. But since then, we've been up in his calories, making sure he's training right. And he's now like at a point where I'd say his calories are back up. He's feeling a lot better in himself. Yeah. And he's kept the weight off. Whereas what I was worried about, because we was in a calorie deficit for mm -hmm. so long, you know, and keep, kept increasing. And, you know, we had highs and lows throughout that. But I didn't want him to get to that point where, you know, we, oh, he's lost this much weight. Yeah, and, and then, well done. And then well done, bang. And he puts two stone back on. And that's what I was really conscious with him. You know, I was yeah. really like, let's just nice and easy that's, keep that's it at that coaching. point and then then i went to the paper and i said like he's done this fantastic mm. thing because i just didn't want him to be demotivated yeah, yeah. by then losing all that weight and then putting it back on yeah, yeah. i think the reverse dieting is is something that's so, so key isn't it to yeah. sustainability and it's typically what the research shows is where where people go on a put a harsh diet 
and they're not coached or taught how to reverse out to maintenance yes. yeah. and it just all goes back. Yeah, so we, we talk about that a lot and that's that's probably the, the biggest part of the coaching process as well. It's like, it's all well and good getting the result, but actually keeping the result is something completely different. So getting a transformation is one thing, keeping the transformation is something completely different. Mm -hmm. And if you can get a client to buy into that progressive phase, like you will change their life yeah. in so many other aspects because you can increase calories where they're confident to actually consume. So say, for example, your friend who's lost 10 stone was on, I'm giving examples here and you, you can cope, but say if he finished on 2000 calories, it may have been a bit higher, but say if he finished on 2000 calories, you know, if he's lost that amount of weight, obviously depending on how long he's lost it over, you could probably put, get him up to eating 3000 plus calories a day over a progressive period. And over that progressive period, his training is going to improve, physique's going to improve, energy levels are going to improve. And you know what? He probably actually still lose weight because he's just, he's just merging that deficit in towards maintenance. Mm -hmm. And what tends to happen, like a lot of people, you know, scientists and other coaches might go, well, just go back to maintenance. It's not just as simple as that. No, no because, it's definitely not. Because clients will shit their pants. Mm -hmm. If you said, right, you're going to increase your That's calories exactly by 30%. That's exactly to say, yeah, he was shitting his pants. Yeah, yeah. You're going to increase your calories. Like you finished on 2,000, you're going to increase your calories by 30%. That's going to take you up to two, six straight away. Like he, we know he's probably still going to lose weight on that if he's still accurate with his login. However, the reality is, psychologically, he's going to go through a bit like, oh, I, hang on a minute. I've been dieting for the last two years, losing 10 stone, which is amazing, by the way, or three years or five years or whatever. Yeah. But let's, you know, they, they don't understand it at that point. And that's down to the coaching process. And if you can get a client to buy into that progressive phase, it makes such a difference. And, and that's what we try and do on P10 as well. A lot of the time is, yes, we get the result with the 10 weeks, hopefully. It might be slower than other processes, but at least at the end of it, you go, yeah. actually, I kept it off. And... Actually, I'm looking more down the route of not just watching the scales. I'm looking down the route of actually, I feel so much better, more confident. I look better, you know, training harder at ETC, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, awesome. Uh, let's just circle back a little bit because we, we've kind of almost got to the end result now and keeping the weight off. We've not even talked about how to get the weight off. Uh, you touched on earlier about sort of different types of people, whether it's, you know, sort of stage competitors or, um, you know, fighters or whatever. And I've, in my experience, certainly myself and, and maybe you as well, mate, doing stage stuff, I think I respond quite well to like a really rigid diet. Yeah. Um, and I'm one of these mental people you talk about where I can literally eat the same thing every single day and don't bat an eyelid. But for me, there's a really clear outcome to that. So that helps keep me motivated. Um, I guess most of your clients, most of our clients, most of our audience are probably your normal sort of people who maybe wouldn't respond well to that type of rigid diet. So what sort of protocol do you typically find the majority of your clients respond best to? Firstly, what I'm going to say to that is um, I do notice that with a lot of guys that I, that I coach that are into boxing, mm -hmm. um, jiu-jitsu, like you've, you guys have, have dealt with clients like that, comp competition clients, obviously they need to go through that rigid process to get the result that they want. However, you're probably doing that for a certain event or like for example making weight yeah. or for example going on holiday and you don't really care because you're in pretty good shape all year round anyway and you're not too bothered you just want to look better for that time mm -hmm. so that does work for a certain date but in terms of longevity it's not going to be as sustainable secondly is what i would say with it again it depends i, I would i would implement more rigid processes with somebody somebody like yourself or somebody who's you know that sort of person, I'm going to say, right, okay, I'm probably going to limit your options here because I know you're going to stick to these three options, four options, six options, whereas somebody else may have 20 options because they like to, they've got a bit more time where they can, and we all talk about time, but a bit more, you know, flexibility with cooking and, and they like to experiment more, more in the kitchen and things like this. But also what we have to consider as well in terms of a physique, like progression, oh, sorry, not progression, but like a physique, um, sort of end point and how good your physique can look. If you're more rigid with the process and you're naturally trained, you're not actually going to get a better physique. If you can actually have more micronutrients in the system, you're actually going to get a better end point and a better end physique. Anyway, hormones are going to be uh, functioning a way better level, way higher level for certain hormones. So, you know, by actually being too rigid, you can actually take those things away. So when I do competition prep with you know one of my clients reese who's won numerous shows natural you know naturally trained um we we, we implement so many other foods that he can actually take on board because we're supporting all these other hormones that need to be considered and a lot of people don't think like that they all think oh well he's eating chicken broccoli rice yeah but he's also pumping loads of gear 
like, let's, let's, let's focus on your hormones. Let's focus on actually, you know, thinking about the quality of, of your training as well. Like th those hormones need to be supported and, and you've got to have those micronutrients in there. Don't get me wrong. You're going to need a rigid plan because that's what's going to make you stick to it. But however, we are going to put in things like, you know, you're going to have salmon at certain times. You're going to have, you know, different vegetables at certain times because that's going to massively help all those other areas and your actual end physique point mm -hmm. rather than just going, oh, I'm just going to eat, you know, fish and a rice cake for 10 weeks. Yeah, you're going to get shredded. Love you're going to get guy. shredded. Love that guy. Yeah. <laughs> but you're going to, you're going to feel like shit. Yeah. And so yeah. with how do you, how do you come to the conclusion of how the different personalities and different people do an online coaching? Like for me, I obviously work one-to-one -one with people. So a lot of the time I get to know them and then I know what they respond to. Whereas yours is a little bit different. And I just wonder how you kind of bridge that gap. Yeah. Well, I would say, first of all, if before anybody goes into online coaching, if you can't get results with your clients face-to-face, -face, do not go on online coaching. Like simple as that. Like if, you can, if you're not getting results with clients one-to-one, -one, and I mean really fucking good results, mm -hmm. then don't worry, don't go online. Because obviously when you've got that face-to-face -face value, uh, you, you've got more buy-in from the client, plus it's more expensive, typically, typically. Not all the time, but typically it's more expensive. Say if someone's paying £40 a PT session, they're seeing you three times a week, that's expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas if they're doing online coaching and they're spending £20, £30 a week, it's a lot cheaper, a lot more accessible. However, you know, you're not getting that face face to face values, but that's that's what I would say in, in terms of that's down to the coach to put systems in place, and put good quality feedback and coaching in place and targets in place, and again clients are different, so females and males are going to respond differently to to different feedback. You guys know that anyway. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you've got to you've got to get those systems in place to get the results online. Um, community is huge as well. What I would say is when people have seen other people getting getting great results. Like they buy into it because they say, well, you know, we've all got excuses to not do it, but what's your excuses to do it? And there's so many other people that we have you know, in our community that are, you know, over 50 that have got world-class results. And then somebody comes in and goes, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm 49. I'm getting on a bit. You know, I'm not going to achieve this. Oh, actually, hang on a minute. They are. And they've got three kids and they've had this injury, that injury, ETC. Mm -hmm. So, it's all about getting people to buy into to that side of things and then backing it up with good quality feedback, targets set on a weekly basis. Don't get me wrong, targets are targets. They're not, as you, as you guys know, things, things go out the window, things happen in life. You know, we all know that, especially like, like you said, from the majority of your viewers are probably gonna be people that have got kids, you know, people that are, that are running numerous businesses, you know, things are gonna happen, but there's, it's about making it flexible and fluid around what they can actually stick to. Mm. So yes, you set a plan, but also if shit hits the fan and you go over on certain days, then we can bank calories. We can we can play around with stuff. We can increase steps on certain days. We can decrease workouts, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many different ways of, of actually getting the result. Mm -hmm. And that's just down to experience and also just just knowing the client as well, which I know is quite difficult when someone signs in, signs up and you've never met them before. Yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to get at, like, with so, so someone like Paul who's quite rigid and then you might have someone like me who likes to have different meals do you specifically say like you know what type of personality do, do you yeah, get yeah. that through like a phone call yeah. or like do you get that yeah yeah so obviously you'd see that on we we, we go through like a, a sort of thorough questionnaire that gets sent out at the start yeah. of, of each course which the client will fill out and say look this is what I tend to tend to eat this is what, what my uh, food allergies are etc it's a bit yeah yeah, and also that's just down to the coaching process. Like the first week, you're not gonna you're not gonna get it perfect. You might get the calories perfect. What we say to people is this is not compulsory. The only thing that's compulsory for the minute is tracking accurately mm -hmm. and staying within calories just to see what that does, and then we can coach. Yeah. So let's go with yes, certain meal you might look at through a meal plan and go, I'm only actually gonna use four of those meals mm -hmm. because you're rigid. You might go, Right, that's world class, I'm gonna use one every day. A different meal every day and i'm gonna batch cook a spag bowl i'm gonna batch cook a fish bag whereas you might go oh i'm just gonna have um you know a tuna pasta bake mm. and just batch cook that yeah. it's easy it's simple i just, it's I just find with like my lifestyle during the day I'm, I'm fine i'm happy being rigid but in the evening because of yes. um my wife and my son i find it hard to cook like i've done it before but cooking separate meals do you know what i mean i just think oh, 
No, it you know needs I mean? to. And then, and then it creates that sort of like, you're not sitting in with tea and you're not, you know No, no, I mean? no, no. That's where, that's where again, 95% of people, mm -hmm. the percentage game again, are going to respond better to family friendly meals. Exactly. Yeah. Are going to respond better to stuff that they can, you know, what yields world-class results. I've seen it time and time again, and it doesn't have to be that clean. Like people think clean food. It's like, well, hang on a minute. That's, it's not dirty food because it's 10% pork mints rather than your 2% turkey mints. It's not, do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, yes, it might be slightly higher in calories, but if we just focus on that rather than focusing on, oh, this food's going to get me more bang for my buck than that one. Yeah, but your kid's not going to eat turkey and rice. Yeah, it's very good. Mm -hmm. And you want to keep it family friendly and almost make you feel like you're not even on a diet. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, those signals are going to happen at some point, but make it feel initially that you're not on a diet. Yeah. And... And then you can you can prep those meals. But what like, like I said, what yields the best results is when somebody can do something like that, batch cook some meals, and utilize that either for lunch or for evenings the next day. Firstly, it saves a shit ton of time, a shit ton of money. Family's happy with it, and you know what? If you don't want it for lunch, you can easily just put in something that's real simple, like a ham fucking sandwich. Mm. Like you're still going to get great results by watching your calories, having something that you can stick to on a long period period of time. Like people eating out of Tupperware all the time, it's not going to happen for your everyday person. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, for the 5% of people, it you know they want to have that focus. They want to go to that level. But don't get me wrong, just because you're eating ham sandwiches and spag bowls in the evening mm -hmm. doesn't mean you can't get super, super lean. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking super lean. Well, this is what I was saying to one of my clients recently is that they were saying that they put on all this weight because they was eating like meal deals and stuff like that. And I'm like, as long as you're in the, within your calories, that's not going to, that's not the reason you're putting on weight. And they were like, oh, it is. I'm not, I don't eat that much. And I'm like, if you, if you get into that point, then you are overeating regularly. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You are overeating. It's not the meal deal that's making you overweight. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. not the fucking, what tends to happen it's not is, the sandwich. <laughs> what tends to happen is when someone comes off a really rigid diet, yes, don't get me wrong. They're going to gain a bit of water weight from eating more flexibility initially. You're going to gain a bit more water weight because you've got more, more sodium in there. You've got more flexible carbohydrates, et cetera, et cetera. However, that will settle down if they're controlling calories. But what tends to happen is they don't control calories. They just stop, stop tracking and go, yeah, but I've been on around the same calories. It's like, no, no, you haven't. You haven't been on the same calories. Um, and the flexibility has been there and you've shit your pants because you've put on two pounds in a week where we already knew that you were going to put on two pounds over that week, probably more, depending on how big your muscles are because they're going to store more water because of sodium, et cetera, you know, mm. water weight, whatever. But yeah, when we talk about calories and, and it's not just as simple as calories in versus calories out, even though calories are king, because when we talk about a certain set calorie amount, we can talk about, you know, the, the different elements within calories. And I'm going to go a bit here. Okay. But let's bear, do it. Bear with me. Let's fucking do bear it. With me. <laughs> but like, for example, say if they're eating, stuff that's really high in thermic effect. So they're eat, eating huge amounts of protein, you know, low GI carbohydrates. We know what thermic effect means, mate. Yeah. I don't think everybody else will. You yeah, have to so, explain so, that. So how much your body's actually going to burn? How many calories your body's actually going to burn processing those foods? Mm -hmm. Okay, so say if you're eating, you know, high in protein, high in low GI fiber carbohydrates, for example, brown rice, brown pasta, can be normal rice as well, but the more fiber in it, it's going to increase thermic effect. Then your calorie net, yeah, say if the same person eats 2,000 calories here and 2,000 calories on meal deals, the net calories are actually less on the person that's eating the real strict calories because of the thermic effect of those, of, of those foods. Yeah. However, it's not going to be a huge, huge difference. It's a huge difference. So if you go, this person's eating turkey, mince, and rice, and this person's eating just chocolate, 2,000 calories and 2,000 calories, like you're probably looking at around a 30% or oh, not 30%, maybe 20% swing there in, in, in terms of calories. So this person actually net calorie might be actually only taking on board 16, 1700, whereas this person's actually processing all the calories. Yeah. So that that's much? where the quality can be. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, and that's where the quality of, of calories does matter. And obviously, as we know that the energy levels that you're going to get from eating better quality foods, however, it's also about making that factor th this in so if you can implement these foods but then also make it a family friendly meal so yes i'm using turkey mints yes i'm using rice but i'll also use some <laughs> some um you know chopped tomatoes some spice some of this some of that some green veg then everyone's happy because it's just a spag bowl mm. or a chili or whatever yeah. yeah i'm just giving you examples here yeah. rather than just going super super clean like like 
Well, well, last it's, time it's, I checked, it's still clean, isn't yeah, it? Last, last time I checked, tomatoes. chopped tomatoes are clean. Mm. Last time I checked, spices are, uh, are fine. They're actually full of... I think the issue you have, though, is when people say about a spag bowl or something like that, they have a dom meal, <laughs> which is like full of sugar and shit, you know? And, and I think that's bridging that gap is saying like, yeah. you know, you can have a spag bowl, but you've got to kind of put the fucking effort in to make it. Do you know what I mean? You've got to... But then again, again, we've got different levels again, haven't we? So if you've got a client that's coming in that's 10 stone overweight, like if he's cooking a, a spag bowl in, he's making effort just by using the dolmio because he was usually fucking eating dol, you know, um, Domino's pizzas before. So that's progression. Mm. So he's going to lose weight if he's doing that. It's the levels again. And as a coach, you've got to go through these levels with clients. Right, okay, this is what you've been doing. You've done really well. You've lost 10 pounds in the last five weeks doing this. Now we're going to implement this. We're going to change. And you're going to go, you're going to give me a bit more effort in. And because they've had the result, they're more likely to buy into the next level. So you don't need to go balls deep. Yeah with the process and the protocol straight away. If someone's eating fucking Domino's pizzas, KFCs every night and drinking all weekend, it's like, hang on a minute, let's put in these sort of things that he's gonna, he's probably gonna stick to, probably gonna enjoy, and he's gonna get results. Yeah. Might not be as quick as the last time he did the cabbage diet, and that's why we're in this position of 10 stone overweight because he's on through a massive metabolic shift, which we can chat about as well, you know, but mm. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 100%. And I, I was gonna ask what, what the key principles are for, for losing weight, and I think we've just covered a fair bit. Um, Sounds like obviously calories are a big, a big factor in energy balance and, yeah. and quality of the food as well. But if you're, I mean, we'll obviously encourage everybody to sign up to your program and they can learn all about it there. But assuming somebody's not going to do that and they're at home listening and they want to start making better choices and start losing a bit of weight. And I think previously when I've been studying nutrition, there's almost like a pyramid of, of sort of, you know, what's the, the fundamentals, which is probably calories. And then it kind of goes up to the tip of the iceberg stuff, which yeah, is yeah, yeah. often the shit that sells books and yeah, yeah, all that yeah, nonsense. Yeah, yeah. But for you as a, as a coach, advising somebody at home, where would you start and what's like, what's the key thing that someone can do to start sort of losing weight and making the right changes? So for losing weight is get a handle of what calories are going in. Okay. Like get a handle of what calories are going in. When people start tracking their calories, like, I'm not expecting people should be tracking all year round, but just let's get a handle of what's going in here. So so on that, that that's, let's dive onto that because I think tracking is, is a really interesting one because how do people track? You know, is, is it using an app? Is it writing it down? And, and for me, in my experience, this is one area that people get really fucking wrong. Um, often people aren't losing weight because they're not in a deficit and sometimes it's because they're just delusional, but often it's because they're, they're, they're just ignorant and they're yeah. getting it wrong. So how, would, how do you advise people track calories? How would well, you get a grip on it? Well, I would use something like an app, like you said. So you're a tracking app. Now, it depends on how rigid the client is. So if you're dealing with a rigid client, I know exactly what calories are in pretty much every food. So if I give you a nutrition plan, I know, you know, and it's a really rigid nutrition plan, yeah. I'm, I'm going to know what calories you're taking on board. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll notify what your calories you're taking on board. However, just in regards to a person before they go and get a coach or before they go and go and manage, how they start to know what they're actually eating is just track for a week. Just track what you're, and I guarantee you, you're going to under eat compared to what you were doing before and because you're tracking anyway. So you'll come back going, oh God. And, and this is, again, this is where it, where coaching happens as well. We talk about the accuracy of your login. Mm. You know, we, this is what I was just about to say. I've had clients that have said to me, oh, I've been tracking all week and they've gone through and I've been like, all right, let's have a look. And we go and have a look and they're, they're substituting stuff. So like, say they have a, I don't know, a wrap from, not from, not from savings week, they've made a wrap at home. And they've not really weighed the chicken. They don't know how much sauce they've put in. They don't know the size of the wrap or they don't, you know what I mean? And then what they'll do is they'll go, oh, I've gone on to Sainsbury's and put in a- 300 calories. 350 yeah, like no calorie yeah. sweet chili wrap. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, that's, that's, you've, you've made yourself like two 700 calorie wraps. Yeah. And then you're wondering well, the wrap, why. A wrap's, and that's, 200, that's, a wrap's 200 calories. That's what I was about to say. Yeah. 198 <laughs> calories. I've been doing it on something like that on thing or from Tesco's or yeah. whatever. But what I was trying to say is, is like, with people counting calories, they've got to be accurate. You know, they've got to get the fucking scales out. They've got to actually take the time to accurately do it. Don't cut corners with it. And that's where they make a lot of mistakes. What I would say there as well. So two, two things I would say there is first of all, yeah, the more accurate you're going to be, the better position you're going to be in moving forward as well. However, if somebody really genuinely can't be asked to track, but they really want to lose weight, obviously you've got to question how much they want to, but also, what I tend to, be, to give people is, mate, give yourself a little buffer. So I've given you 2,250 calories, right? Give yourself two, 2,100 or 2,000 calories. So you don't need to be weighing your fucking milk and your coffees. You don't need to be 
watching some of the sources that are going in because you know you've got that little buffer zone. And if I will change things on a weekly basis, like that's a coach's job to go, well, hang on a minute. If someone's logging 1,200 calories and they're not losing weight, they ain't eating 1,200 calories over time. Like they ain't. Do you know what I mean? No one came out of a prisoner of war camp overweight. <laughs> That's Nobody came. Oh yeah, I've got thyroid issues, mate. That you're controlled on these calories. Like you will lose weight if you're sticking to it. As we know, sticking to those sort of calories is so so hard. Like you have to have a serious reason why you're sticking to those calories. Mm. And most people don't have that reason. They just want to lose a bit of weight, and they also don't want to feel like shit because they're running businesses, got three kids. But you can't be eating twelve hundred calories when you when you when you're dealing with kids. No, to be off the bridge. <laughs> you know what um, I mean? Okay, cool. So getting a grip of the calories. So that's <laughs> kind of like first thing. And then, and then what next? So again, what I would talk about is, um, so we can talk about nutrition as much as we want, but also training plays a huge role mm -hmm. in psychological approach and also what you're going to do with your nutrition. As you guys know, if you've got a good session in the bank and you're doing Three, three sessions a week and you're getting good sessions in, it's likely going to cross over into your nutrition as well. You're going to- It's hand in hand. Yeah. And it's going to give you that sort of impetus and energy, like actually expending the energy actually is actually going to give you more energy, more focus in probably achieving your goals as well. Mm -hmm. So the training's huge. I, w I used to think it was more nutrition. Like now as a coach, I would actually say it's more 50-50. Um, a lot of people go, oh, it's 80% diet, 20% training. I would actually say it's more 50-50. If you can commit to say three times per week and get your body moving, get some activity and get a bit of a sweat on, doesn't need to be silly. Like, it depends again on levels. If you've got somebody who's never trained before, mate, go out for a walk three times. Go out for yeah. a th walk three times a week, 20 minutes. That's all it needs to be. It doesn't need to be something like CrossFit style sessions, <laughs> you know, where you get injured in, tw in 20 seconds because they've never done anything before. Like you have to be smart with those approaches because it, again, the client won't, won't do it for long term, but that's going to massively back up the nutrition side of things. And obviously you're putting yourself into more of a deficit mm -hmm. because you're going slightly higher on calories. Like you said at the start, Danny, is like going, you know, we start higher on calories. That is the, the, the smartest way of going. You're still in a deficit. They don't think, they probably don't think they're in a deficit, but if you were tracking Monday to Sunday, Monday to Sunday, not Monday to Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, do what you want, Monday to Sunday, if you're eating 2,000 calories, the majority of people who are listening to this, especially guys, you are in a big deficit. Yeah. If you're doing Monday to Sunday, 2,000 calories, you're in a big, big deficit. How many All people right. get a takeaway on a Saturday? Do you know what I mean? How many? And they don't even factor it. They, 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 they diet all the way through. Saturday comes, you know, they might have like a little bacon sandwich during the day. And then they'll go and they'll be like, right, I'll have a fucking pizza of tea or whatever. And then they raid the and cupboards. Then, and then, yeah, they raid the cupboards and everything else. And yeah. they still, you know, slowly losing weight. But if they actually committed to 2,000 a day, they don't realize that overfilling yeah. that cup by 2,000 calories is making the rest of the week yeah. out of the deficit. And also you know? what tends to happen as well is, <laughs> mate, we can talk about this for years, but like, you know, if you go again quite low with calories, the tendency to binge over on that day is quite high. And if you if you start putting alcohol in the mix as well, mm -hmm. say if you say if you say if you've got a client who's eating you know fifteen hundred calories, and on the weekend they they binge because they want to binge because they've been eating fifteen hundred calories. They've had a bit of a, a work week on a Friday and Saturday night. Go out, have a few beers, probably a few few more. Um, by the Sunday and the Monday. When you've got to readdress 1,500 calories, it's fucking hard work, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You're hungover, you're yeah. low on energy. Shit, I've got to prep my meal so I'm on 1,500 again. That's why it doesn't last long. Yeah. So we need to, do, I'm not saying people can't have those things on weekends. Like, obviously you're going to do it, but just controlling it. If you can control those elements, you're going to win massively. I think that's a key point. It's, it's, it's just that mindless drinking and eating, isn't it? That's the issue. You mentioned earlier about undulating calories throughout the week. And this is typically how I diet if I'm trying to. Um, where I'll maybe have sort of, I've even done sort of intermittent fasting where I'll have a, a really low calorie day, maybe once or twice, have yep. sort of moderate calories in throughout the week. And on the Saturday, I have like 4,000 calories, yep. but I can still only have 4,000 calories. Yeah, yeah. So I still can't mindlessly just eat what I want. Yeah. And a lot of people That's think really 4,000 calories a lot. Well, how, how many, how many calories are in a pint? It's 300, isn't it? Yeah, about three, about 250. That's yeah, what I'm saying. Two. How many people go to a pub? Well, a, pe a pizza's, a pizza's 3,000 calories. That's what I mean. So you imagine if they have a pizza and have 10 pints over a night, which is fucking easily done. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, these, then, and then that's 6,000 calories yeah, yeah. without even thinking yeah. it. And then they're wondering why they don't get results. Yeah. You know what I mean? And these things can happen still. Like these things can happen. Like we all do it occasionally, but you just want to want to re re like rein in the frequency of it's happening. If it's happening every weekend, there's the answer to why you're not getting towards your goals. Simple as that. 
Like, let's control that. When you get to that next level, then you can start putting other protocols in place. I think place. it's really hard for people, though, isn't it? Because they kind of work really hard. They get to that that Friday, Saturday night, don't they, or whatever, and they're, they're, they're just fucked. They're like, oh, you know what, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they end up doing that, don't they? Yeah, it's tough, man, for sure. So you mentioned, obviously, getting a grip of your calories coming in, and then we talked about calories going out, and you say it's 50-50. Um, I, I feel like this is probably a long answer, um, but people are going to wonder, is there a particular type of training that is best for losing weight? Whatever the client can commit to. Okay. Really that simple. If the client could, you know, it's all well and good giving people really hard sessions that are going to burn a lot of calories that are going to give great physical results. So, you know, we do some, some crazy sort of kettlebell based sessions mm. that people might love initially, but they're probably not going to be, a, you've got to, to, again, we're talking at different levels. What is the client going to commit to? But say if you get a client to stick to one of these, you know, 50 minute, 60 minute sessions, that's fucking hard ass work they're probably not going to be walking for the next two days. <laughs> so then calories that they burnt during the session, oh yeah, I burnt an extra 200 calories than I would have done on a walk though. Mm. Yeah, you did burn an extra 200 calories, but now you're sat on your ass for two days because you can't fucking move. Mm -hmm. So your your main goal, your main goal is to lose weight. Let's let's start, like yeah. that's, that's your main goal initially. Hopefully over the next sort of five, six, 10 weeks, maybe longer, then we can start to focus, depending on the starting point, we can then start to focus on actual, how you feel, physical development, you know, muscle shape tone all that balls you know mm -hmm. what we actually want to actually what, what they're actually probably there for but initially it's all on the scales yeah no that's just, it's a good point and these days i'm probably more sort of clinical fitness and, and rehabilitation type uh, delivery but we always used to say as a uni when we were doing our training was what's the best exercise for rehabilitation one you can adhere to yeah that is yeah. so adherence key. is everything with yeah. nutrition with training don't get me wrong you don't need to adhere to a diet forever as we spoke up before you you just need to adhere to the diet that you can stick to for until you get the result yeah. and then you go into that progressive metabolic phase what do you feel what do you feel about like negative calories with people using their their exercise and then adding it onto their food I see that all the time yeah. with people so they'll my biggest issue with it personally is that they don't know how they, it's fucking nearly yeah. impossible tracking those amount of fucking yeah, calories. They rely on the older devices, oh, which, mate, aren't that which are not that. You got yeah, it. and, and I speak I've to people all the time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I speak to people all the time, and they go, "Well, I've I've burnt eight hundred calories on the on the cross trainer, so I'll just add that onto that." And I'm like, "No," and they're like, "What?" So what, what do you think about that? Okay, a couple of things. First of all, is like you said, the accuracy from watch to watch. I used to have a Garmin watch, and it was like way less. I had a Fitbit on the other arm, like double the calories. Mm. But but what I would say is um, what I would say as well there is if you're doing that if you're if you're going right okay yeah but I burnt that calories that's a great way for maintenance mm -hmm. a great yeah, way yeah, yeah. for maintenance if you want to literally go oh well yeah I've done eight hundred calories so that means I deserve to have this that's a great way of maintaining I'm not going to say you're not going to get fitter because you're training you're burning oh I burnt eight hundred calories in that session great keep doing what you're doing if your goals are fitness and you know, developing your physique in terms of not a conditioned state, but in terms of just developing muscles and whatever else, keep doing what you're doing. It's a great way to maintain. However, when you start factoring that in, like we factor that into all our diets beforehand anyway. Like when people come to me and go, oh, is this including that? I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like I've, I've already taken that into account. That's why it's not 1200 calories. Like I've already taken into account step count. I've taken into account your total daily energy expenditure, what you're doing on a daily basis. If you get a postman who's banging in 25,000 steps a day, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've got I've got I've got a client who's a postman, yeah. and he and he does yeah, thirty thousand some days. Yeah, you could probably get his calories up to three and a half, four thousand calories, and he's still going to lose weight because of the step count and the, what he's doing, you know. Uh, but you start him on something that he's comfortable with, but also if you go too low, you know, mm -hmm. um, he can't sustain it. Then can he? Yeah, you know, and he's just doing too, just doing too much activity. Like like I was saying to you guys again before we went live about you know the difference between my calories since I became more admin based to when I was on gym floor. Most people go, oh yeah, but you're, you're, you know, you're 10 years older now. It's like, no, no, no. I'm actually more, I've actually got more muscle now than I did then as well. So actually my BMR is probably higher than what it was then anyway. That's your basal metabolic rate. Your coma state calories and what you're going to burn is dictated by, you know, metabolic rate and, and also muscle mass, body weight mainly. Um, however, or I'm also way more admin based. Mm -hmm. So before I was doing 20,000 steps a day could easily do 4,000 calories a day and probably still lose weight on that if I, if I did Monday, Sunday. Neat, neat a lot yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then now it's like, well, hang on a minute. If I want to actually lose weight, sig significant body fat while still maintaining as much muscle, then I'll, I'll probably need to be down to 3,000 calories. Yeah, yeah. Maybe drop that slightly lower. I, I would never drop my calories down lower than, even when I was doing a competition, I would never drop my calories lower than 2, 4. Mm -hmm. 
I genuinely, I genuinely want it. And 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 um, I'd rather have a longer period mm-hmm. to diet than to go. Right, I've got eight weeks mm-hmm. because you just you you end up losing a lot of the lean si- yeah. size that you put the hard work on in, in getting anyway. So yeah, if you can keep your calories as high as possible mm-hmm. um, while still losing weight, if that's your goals, yeah. then that's going to be the best best format. And don't get me wrong, you're going to have weeks where you know. And I know that most of your viewers are, are male, but if you're going to have females that go up and down, they have two weeks where they don't lose weight. Mm-hmm. That's why sometimes dieting with females tends to be a bit more difficult because of the psychological reason. Oh, I haven't lost two we- for two weeks, so it's not working. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, but also you're on HRT and also you're on this and that, you know, but hey, we won't talk about that here. Yeah, <laughs> no, definitely. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think it's a really good point. It's not something that I've ever done is included training for sure. Um, okay, so... Get an idea of your calories, um, training. We've talked about that. Things like macronutrients. I mean, that's just firstly start with explaining what macronutrients are. Would you be so kind? Yep. So macronutrients are our main energy source of different foods. So you've got protein, fats, and carbs. And obviously, if you want to include fiber in that as well, that would probably tend to go under the, 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 the uh, carbohydrate uh, macronutrient. Um, obviously, each macronutrient contains different amounts of calories. So protein, you've got four calories. Carbs, you've got four calories. Fats, you've got nine calories. So calories in fats are much more dense. Now, this would support most people going, you know, for example, I don't know how much you want me to goose certain methods, but say if someone's doing, you know, Slimming World, you know, a lot of the method and the the methodology that what they're going with is going to be stripping out fats because obviously... Yeah. They're highly dense in calories. And it does make sense because obviously you're going to push yourself into a deficit. However, the sustainability and the demonization of foods by doing that, and actually, again, on hormonal status, it's not going to It's not going to last. It's not going to last and it's not going to end in a good It amount. creates bad relationships with food. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and when you start demonizing foods and think, oh, well, I can't eat an avocado because it's, you know, it's fucking 240 <laughs> calories. It's like... Yeah, but hang on a minute. And that's where we need to start thinking about macronutrients. The best diet and what I found the most success with the majority of my clients, not all my clients, the majority of my clients, and I'm talking 90 plus percent. So that's a lot of people, you know, that's a lot of people is not stripping out any of the macronutrients. Like you strip out carbohydrates and I know people have had results from that and people can get results from that, but can you stick to it long term? And also it's still not the best way of getting results. Like carbohydrates are still our main energy source for your body and your brain. Mm. So you still need carbohydrates in there. It's the quality of carbs when you start talking about simple and complex. Again, we can go on a massive tangent about that, that you want to be fueling and, and focusing on what 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 carbohydrate you're taking on board for your goals. However, no macronutrient should be restricted. Like your fats should never be restricted. Don't get me wrong. Again, we've got different a range and spectrum of quality of fats. So if you're stripping out fats just because they're high in calories, you're going to end up with with issues hormonally. You're going to end up with issues, you know, with training, with with all sorts of, of different areas, um, with your skin, with with all these things, you know. And and that, that's what people get sort of, oh, I've dropped my carbs. But then again, a lot of people think they've dropped carbs, but then they don't actually drop carbs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've dropped carbs. And you sat there eating a banana. I'm like, <laughs> what? That's carbs? Oh, you meant you meant you've dropped the shit, you mean? You've stopped eating Domino's pizza. That's not dropping carbs. That's just dropping the shit that you were eating. <laughs> yeah. That's why you're getting results. It's so, so true. Rather than going, yeah, I'm on no I'm on the no carb yeah. diet. And he's, yeah. and he's putting no, milk in his yeah. shake. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, well, milk's more carbs than protein. You do know that, don't you? Oh, oh no, nah, no. Nah. No, I meant, yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not boozing on Saturdays. Right, that's why we're getting results. <laughs> you haven't dropped carbs. Um, what split do you tend to use of, of macronutrients? Yeah, I, I wanted I wanted to ask, and, and just on to that point, because um, one, one of the things that I've always admired about your results is that your your clients not only lose fat, but they always maintain muscle. So I wanted to ask, you've just said that obviously macronutrients, you just don't sort of rule out any, which is great, because I think a balanced diet is really key. But in regard to like protein, do you set parameters? And to Danny's yeah. question then, what yeah. is the split of protein, fat, and carbs? Okay, so at a base point, initially, before you start working with the client, what I would say is try to go with about a 20 to 25% protein amount of their of their macronutrient, sorry, of their calorie total. Okay. So, you know, say if they're eating 2,000 calories, you're probably looking at around 100 grams per day. Yeah. Okay, so that's, 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 20 that's, that's lower than common belief. 
yeah, we can always increase it though, but let's go with 20 to 25%. Yeah. Um, I will, I will cover that more so in a second. And then with fats and carbs, what I would tend to go with fats is probably around a, um, a 30%, 25 to 30%, and with carbs around a 45%, okay? This should allow people to still have flexibility in there, massive flexibility. Um, they're still gonna get great results from doing that if the quality of carbohydrates are there. However, when people start to train more frequently, the need for more carbohydrates is there because obviously they're training five, six, seven times a week, twice a day. Like you need more carbohydrates, but you also need more protein. But you also don't want to drop your fats probably lower than 20% because that's going to support hormonal side, the side of things. So what I tend to do is with those sort of clients is, is probably go with the 25 to 30%. And don't get me wrong, if you're going over that and you're still hitting say 20% on your, on your fats, then the carbohydrates and you feel fine, then, then, then that's fine to implement. However, we go on a, if you're training more frequently, then your protein needs to go up. Because especially if you're in a deficit, you're going to be, you're putting more emphasis on that as an energy source and, and, and delving into lean tissue stores. So you want to protect it as much as you can. So the higher the protein, the better, if you're training more frequently. There's no point in us talking to, about macronutrient splits if someone's not training though. Like, let's just get your calories right. Let's get the quality of food right. The macronutrients tend to take care of themselves if you're not training that frequently. And then as you start to train more frequently, we talk, start talk, talking about the pyramid again, then you're training more frequently now. Now we can address this. Now we can go, right, okay, what's your protein at? That's a that's the second question I ask, first of all. Like, get the calories right first. Right, okay, you're training three, four times a week. Right, let's have a look at his protein. What protein is he taking on board? Oh, he's only taking on 90 grams a day and he's training four times a week in the gym, you know, and he's in quite a large deficit. He's losing weight. We need to push that up. That's going to maintain the muscle mass whilst they're going through that dieting phase. Um, and in regards to macronutrient split on a fats and carb level as well, what I always say to people as well is, is down to preference as well. Mm. So if you prefer smaller meals that are higher in fat, go for that. If you prefer more satiating meals with lower fat, go for that. However, don't strip one of the macronutrients out completely. Mm. But if you are training more frequently, I would lean towards a higher carbohydrate. But when we talk about deficits and stuff, they're still on pretty low carbs. Even if their carbs are at 45%, if you're, if you're on 2000 calories, that's still lower carbs than what you've been eating. <laughs> that's still lower carbs than what you've been eating. Trust me. Just because your percentages may have changed. Oh yeah, I was only eating 30 Yeah, but Domino's pizzas also are high in fats. You know, your ice creams that you're having every day is high in fats. That's why your fats were through the roof. Oh, my carbs have only ever been 40%. Yes, but now we're actually in a deficit and we're eating better quality foods. Like you'll get world-class, you know, if, if you can get your carbs between 40 and 50, that team seems to be the best range for, me, for a lot of clients that, you know, that are training reasonable amount, mm -hmm. then that seems to be the, the, a good base point. Protein, I would say minimum, absolute minimum 20%. If you're training more frequently, start to up it and fat absolute minimum 20% as well. So it's yeah. really interesting isn't it? because you speak to most people and they would not go against that, but they would say they base it around protein mm. and then <laughs> fill in the macros from the carbs and the, you know what I mean? So like I've known people to, to do 45% protein, you know what I mean? And then, and then fill in the carbs and the fats from, from that remaining 55%, which again, isn't wrong, but it's a completely different way. Yeah, but you leave a lot less to flexibility and actual, um, you know. Yeah, it's really interesting. That's what I mean by yeah, what, yeah. what you're doing is you're giving probably the, the everyday person a lot more flexibility because let's be honest, most people love carbs and fats. You mm -hmm. know, the, the, the protein and chicken and stuff like that's nice. You know, obviously it's, it's got its place. But if you, if you give most people like pasta and, and really high satiating foods, they're going to like that. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. long as their calories are controlled. Yeah. Then it, no one's going to really overeat on chicken breasts, are they? No, no that's what... No, wrong. No, you, know, no. you can eat... Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've just had 300 yeah. grams of chicken. It's like, mate, that's only that's, 300 that's, calories. Like, yeah. 320 calories yeah. or whatever. Like, no one's going to carry on eating that unless it's drooled in sauce from Nando's or whatever. But yeah, you, you're exactly right. Like, with the carb... And that's where it needs to be down to control again is when you start having these um, very palatable foods going in that are carbohydrates and fats and you just want to over consume them. Mm. And that's where the tracking of those foods need to be done. And that's why I would say as well is anybody tracking their intake, you need to be, whether you're, whether you like it or not, whether you like tracking your foods or not, and you're like, oh, it's a bit of a ball ache. One thing you do need to track is 
your fats to the gram initially, not forever, initially, because my tablespoon of peanut butter and my missus's tablespoon of peanut butter is totally different. Hers is 20 grams, mine's fucking shovel full. So the calories there, all of a sudden are 300 different, but I've only had a tablespoon and she's only had a tablespoon, mm. but I've had 300 calories more than her. Yeah. There. So people need to get on top of the fats because they're, the, the, and you might think, oh, that's, so that's not dense. that much. Yeah, it's, it's so it's, calorie dense. It's like oil as well, isn't it? When people use olive oil, they just don't even consider that as, as a calorie. And it's... I do that on a lot of lives, you know. Yeah, do like, you? I do, yeah, with our clients. We always get a few laughs with it. It's just people just drink, going like that with oil. Like, it's a really healthy meal. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, tablespoon of oils, 120 calories. Yeah, mm. I had a client who, who used to have a salad all the time. <laughs> she used to be like, I love salads, I love salads and stuff. She's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. She's lost a little weight. But when I first met her, she's like, I love salads. And then I was like talking to her and then, so what'd you put in your salads? And she's like, well, blah, blah. Oh, an olive oil. And I was like, how much? She's like, well. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? What's that? Yeah. yeah that's probably yeah. fucking 400 calories there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 500. And again, we're not demonizing it. All I'm saying is just controlling it. If you're going to have knowing it, that, yeah. that's the big issue. It's the education on knowing that that olive oil has that many calories in. How many people don't know that? Mm. Do you know what I mean? How many people just chuck it in? When they cook chicken, they think they're cooking healthy and then they'll just be like, oh yeah, just fucking boom. Oil. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and even, if, yeah, yeah. Even if it's still healthy, they're wiping their deficit out. Oh, yeah, killing it. Killing so, it. So yeah. yeah, oh yeah, but it's fucking healthy that though. Because you, because you, you know, so fucking healthy. That's why I've had a whole pack. Yeah, but that's just wiped the deficit out. And when we talk about fats as a percentage, like let's hit your 20%, 25, 30%, I would say maximum, that sort of macro range, but let's control the portion sizes. You don't need that much because they're so calorie dense. You don't need that much of it. You don't need that much of it to hit those calorie targets. Trust me. So there should be small portions of it. They should never be taken completely out of the diet, but you should have small. So what I tend to do with, again, people that are more rigid and prep clients is they will have a salmon based dish in there every third day. For amigas, yeah, 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 for and, amigas yeah. but but what tends to happen and for good quality fats? But what tends to happen is when you when you put a more calorific food in there like that, because salmon is quite more calorific than chicken, is you have to drop the carbs down. Yeah. And he's like, and then eventually they don't like doing that meal because they no, don't have as much. So usually they have like say, you know, eighty grams of rice or hundred grams of rice for that meal. But all of a sudden now it's just salmon and veg, mm. or salmon and a tiny bit of you know potato or whatever. It's like, it's not as satiating because it's a smaller meal, but it's great for having those sort of fats in if you're being rigid. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those, those sort of things just need to be monitored closely. That's the initial phase. Like if you're starting to track or you're starting to get a handle on what calories are going in, those are the things that need to be measured to the gram initially. Carbs and fats. If someone, mate, I'm, and people think, oh, I've got to track everything. You need to track everything. It's like, mate, you don't need to be tracking your vegetables, really. Like, let's be honest, unless you're smashing loads of oil on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're just having veg, Mate, you can be, you can still put that in, but it, you're going to be a 20 calorie shift either way. It's not going to make no fucking difference. And and with when you say when you say veg, I'm assuming you're meaning like green leafy veg opposed to potatoes. Absolutely. So potatoes, it would still be a, a yeah, not a not a, um, a so fibrous yeah, vegetables, yeah, fibrous vegetables yeah. rather than rather than actual like a, a, a starchy carb. Yeah. Um, so yeah, anything that's a, that's a low, you know low calorie vegetable then absolutely and again no one's going to overeat on that yeah. unless they're smashing loads of seeds that's exactly what I say to yeah. my clients just just yeah. you know your salad your bits and you know just have that fill up on it yeah, a little yeah. bit you know but don't add shit to it yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> bit okay. of salt and pepper if you want it I joked with one of my clients years ago who wanted to eat all sorts of fucking rubbish and I said look you can eat what you want as long as you eat a kilo of broccoli first <laughs> eat what you fucking want <laughs> <have. laughs> what he's talking about <laughs> And obviously she didn't do it. On the toilet four times, yeah. like, four times every hour. But I knew she'd get, she'd get like uh, into that broccoli and she, she'd be full. She won't want to eat anything. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. fiber's going to fit her up. Yeah, um, so, something we talk about a lot on courses is just if you're struggling to stick to the calories, because eventually when people stick to it, after three or, two or three weeks, the, the deficit starts to kick in. And you start to, they, they start to get these hormonal shifts. And we're not going to talk about leptin, ghrelin, all these other hormones that are going to get affected. But... Um, that's when they'll start to feel it. And I'll say, right, okay, right. You're starting to lose weight, but we also don't want to drop calories. But I also want to keep the ball rolling here nicely because you're progressing really nicely is to stop you from feeling hungry is we look at the quality of foods they're eating. So I'll look through their log and I'll go, okay, yes, you're staying within calories, but you're eating a McDonald's for lunch. Let's let's change that out for something good quality. And if they're eating good quality and they're going through the, because you're, you're still going to go through these experiences, whether you're eating good quality foods or not, like eventually you you will establish the deficit and the hormones are going to kick in. 
might just be a bit later with better quality foods. But then we start to go, right, okay, let's start loading up the portion sizes of your lower calorie foods. So to make you feel like you're having loads more food, so doubling your broccoli amount, doubling the green beans amount. It doesn't have to be just greens, mm. you know, but just doing st certain things like that that are going to make them almost trick the brain again. Yes, it's having an extra 20, 30 calories per meal, but it's not going to make any difference because by the time they've eaten it, it's almost like registered yeah. rather than them, you know, having a small meal and then going, fuck me, I'm hungry. Mm. And then the cupboards start getting opened and they start getting emptied. Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. With um, with with protein, so you mentioned that's obviously super important, and especially as somebody starts training more and more. Um, with things like, I guess we won't go too much into to the finer Biomechan details. Yeah, biomechanistry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but obviously leucine, which is one of the branching amino acids, which is obviously signaling muscle protein synthesis, and there's a, a, a sort of refractory period with that. But do you get into that sort of stuff? Do you say yeah. to people that you need to eat certain types of protein that have that a large amount of that in it? And how often? Yeah, so like crossing that leucine threshold, yeah. which has been documented scientifically. Yeah. However, it depends on the client again. Like it really does depend on the client. Like in my, obviously when we coach our clients on a one-to-one -one basis via their check-in, you, you may bring that up in their meals. So when you're going through their meals, you might go, right, okay, let's start putting this form of protein in because you're gonna get more bang for your buck out of it. Mm. Um, or the, um, it's usually the amount per meal just to get past that leucine threshold, mm. which tends to be about 20 grams, by the way, of protein in a meal, which isn't a lot. However, um, you start talking about ve vegetarians and vegans. Yeah, I was literally, then, literally start, about to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then it, it starts getting quite difficult at times. And then obviously the quality of the aminos or the the essential aminos don't get hit with some certain. Don't get me wrong. There's going to be vegans and vegetarians watching this that go, "Well, hang on a minute. No, I get this because I put this, this, and that." Yes, but it's harder work to get all of the oh. essential amino acids into a meal to then kickstart leucine threshold yeah. or go past that threshold. Um, but what I would say to that is, you know, say if someone's quite low on their protein intake on certain meals is all I would put in is little snacks that are going to complement that meal. So for example, I'm giving you examples here, like, you know, you might laugh, but say if, you know, you've got a ham sandwich and you've only got one slice of ham in it. And by the time you've had the meal with whatever else, probably looking at around 15 grams of protein. Like I'll say, right, okay, put a baby bell light with that. Mm. Like put that in there. That's That's got you up to 20 grams. It's only an extra 40 calories, 50 calories. And you're getting more protein in without them thinking about it too much. Mm -hmm. So little tactics and strategies like that. But also then, yeah, we can talk about, you know, different protein sources that I would implement that, like I said, are going to give more bang for their buck. So like, you know, with turkey, you're going to get a bit more um, higher protein content in that meal, yeah. uh, in that food source than you would from, from other meats. Yeah. Um, but it's not something that I would overthink. Yeah. Okay. Like a lot of people overthink it so much. That's exactly yeah, what I was about to say. Yeah. yeah. Think, oh think, my God, am I hitting this amino acid? It's like, mate, mate, you don't need to worry about that. You're like, you're out all weekend. Unless, you, unless, you, if, unless you want to be a top end bodybuilder. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's, it's not, not, what do you think about, um, like supplementation or like BCAAs and all that type of stuff? Do you encourage yeah. people to do that? Yeah. So again, creatine, creatine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Creatine. Absolutely. Um, I would definitely implement creatine if you're training, you know, frequently with weights, I would definitely, I would definitely implement creatine. Um, BCAAs. So when we talk about, again, I don't want to make this a, a vegan and, and vegetarian podcast, but like something like a BCAAs can actually really back up those meals as well. Well, and, I, was, and, I, was, I was going to ask because, and, and I thought this might have been where you were going. You said about the baby bell. So if someone is on a, on a, a sort of specialist diet or vegan or a vegetarian diet and the, the protein isn't complete and therefore they're struggling to get to that leucine threshold, is that where you might recommend a, a BCAA um, yeah, supplement? Yeah, you could do. You could do for sure, yeah. for sure. But a lot of the time, people are just using BCAAs as almost like just a fucking tasty drink. Yeah. That's the issue. People swigging it, it walking yeah. around the gym. Well, a lot of my yeah. clients will come in and they go, oh, "I just bought some BCAAs." I was like, "Why?" Yeah, yeah. And they're like, "Well, you know, see it, <laughs> see it on my protein." Sexy, I'm like, sexy, yeah. "You don't need it." <laughs> like, you actually at this point, you do not need it. And they're like, "Oh, well, what do I do with it?" Like, just, just. Don't use it. You don't need it. Don't or use it with, with meals or potentially post-workout. You can use it um, alongside a shake or whatever, but... I like, to, I like to add it later on. Yeah, I wouldn't use it during a workout. We can talk about all these things about, you know, 
putting in certain, you know, I know there's studies out there that probably suggest that, that having the BCAAs join a workout may help, but there's also studies that don't as well. So, you know, we have to take it onto that base point. And, and also when you've coached loads of people, you know what gets results. Like you can talk about the perfect diet, but you know what gets results. And you can talk about all these different supplementation or supplements that you want to implement. But what I tend to implement with clients most frequently is creatine. Um, is a multivitamin and is if they're not getting that many good quality fats in, I, I supplement an omega-3. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was doing Not an omega-369, six, six just an omega-3. Yeah. Um, that's all they need to utilize and implement. And if, yeah, if you're training quite frequently and heavy and, and hard, then I would implement a protein shake as well because first of all, I think for ease, because post-workout, it's just easy as fuck to get 30, 40 grams of protein in, in, in a hit. And... And, and actually, you're going to need those. You're going to, again, if you're training quite frequently, you're going to need that amount of protein in anyway. Mm. Um, you don't want to be having an extra meal in when you're going back to the family to have a you know a family cooked meal. Like, just get the protein shake in. That's all the supplementation you will need, and you will get world class results. Like people are so overthink, and we can talk about natural stimulations of, of certain hormones using natural um, you know supplementation and things like that. That I would implement with naturally competing clients but we're way off that with with the majority of people Mm -hmm. Uh, let's get these base points right first and a lot of the foods we eat are going to dictate hormonal status anyway so people go oh yeah i'm starting taking this um this this supplement that's going to naturally increase my testosterone levels yeah but you're suppressing your testosterone levels by drinking 10 pints on a friday (laughs) saturday night so let's get the quality of foods right there first. That's going to have a massive base point on your hormonal status initially. And then we can start adding some things in. And when, and do you need to ha- to add those supplements in when you're in a maintenance slash surplus? Probably not because you're not putting the hormones under pressure. But when you're in a deficit and you're in a, you know, you've been in that deficit for a long period of time and you start getting really lean, then yeah, you may need a bit of support. Mm. But let's get the quality of foods in there first and, and, and actually focus on that beforehand and like we said about the pyramid the pyramid is so so important we, we focus on different blocks and at different levels yeah. and people are so keen be amazing like people won't pay for a certain service of coaching but they'll happily pay 100 quid for a, for a supplement mm. but what tends to happen is they get results because they start eating better because they're taking a supplement yeah. that tends to happen yeah they sort of um, have behavior, oh, yeah. I spent 100 quid on this supplement for this month so I better start eating fucking chicken and rice you know what yeah. I mean <laughs> Yeah, no, 100%. All goes hand in hand, doesn't it, with stuff? And yeah, going going back to the the career team because we I'll just let you <laughs> and, and and I want to go back to it because there's still myths around this. So I, not naming names, but I was sat with a GP recently, quite an experienced senior GP and a physiotherapist, and while sat with them, someone asked me as a, as a PT about whether their son should take creatine, adult son should take creatine because they're trying to start training. And before I could even answer, these pair, the GP and the physio, went, oh my God, absolutely not. It's going to ruin his kidneys. Right. <laughs> so, so, so their what age? He was an adult. Adult. Yeah, yeah he was an adult. like 12. No, he was an adult. Right. Get him on the supplements yeah. early doors. But I, I guess the point I'm making is even, <laughs> even within healthcare, there's certain professionals. So having, you know, I don't know what normal people think, but people still think that too much protein will break your kidneys and... Uh, creatine will underpin that wrecking of your kidneys yeah yeah so what are your thoughts on that so, so what i would say is obviously if you've got underlying issues then yeah it may do because you've got underlying issues mm-hmm. and that should all be you know spoken about with your healthcare professional doctor however um you know like we said before you're not gonna a lot of people aren't gonna overeat on protein like they're not gonna really super overeat on protein like you're not gonna have people eating you know unless they're bodybuilding 300 plus grams a day it's just not gonna happen it's quite hard to do that it's really hard to do that, actually. And the need for protein, funnily enough, if you're you know, listening into this podcast and you think, yeah, but I'm not dieting. Like, I just want to put on size or I want to maintain. The need for protein is actually less because you've got more calories to play with. Mm-hmm. You've got more energy. You've got more glycogen. You've got more of free fatty acids that you can use for energy anyway. So protein should actually increase when you go into a deficit. And the further you go into a deficit, you should actually increase even more. Whereas... When, especially as you get really lean because you're putting more pressure on lean tissue because you've got less fat stores. But actually when you're in a maintenance or surplus, your calories will take care of the fact you don't need to be over-consuming on protein anyway. Now, but in terms of the question on, on kidneys, what I would say is 
mate, it depends on, on the dosage again. Like if you start having, you know, 50 grams of creatine, I'm sure it would have side effects. You'd probably shit yourself before you start having, <laughs> having, having um, before you start having um, kidney issues. Mm. Um, do you have but, a certain protocol you advise to your yeah, clients of like, yeah. you know, daily dosage? Do they, um, do they load at the start? Do you do any of that nah. sort of stuff? The reason why I don't do use the loading phase is because it's ball ache. People have got to think too much. You know what people are like? The majority of people just want protocols of like, right, take five grams a day, three grams a day if you're female, potentially, depending on size. We can talk about that, whatever. But five grams per day, one scoop, that's all you need. What I would do with creatine, um, and the studies are there to show you that it's a well-documented supplement. Like you, I think it's the most, most yeah, most that's what I was about to say. Yeah, yeah, it's insane. Yeah. Like most people go, oh, you know, does it work? And it's, it's like, yeah, it does. Like if you, if you, you know, the but again, ATP it's not a magic amount. pill. It's not a magic yeah, yeah, pill. Absolutely, the, 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 the percentage is like between like seven and twelve percent extra, isn't yeah. it? Of, I don't of know, like performance or something. Yeah, yeah. Like well, yeah, yeah. when, when you finish your point, I was going to ask what creatine actually does, just for yeah. people at home. Well, to so, know. so, so, say for example. Um, like you said about that as well, like you're going to see an accumulative effect of it as well. You're not going to see an acute effect. Fuck me, I've just taken some crit and now I can lift fucking 200 kilos. No, no, no. You're going to see an accumulative effect that may be in that range of percentage. So you're not, yes, if you're doing a loading phase, you'll probably see that more effect quicker, but then it's ball like anyway. Um, what I would say with creatine is studies out there that have shown that taking it with caffeine tends to hinder the intake of it, whether that's documented enough I don't know, but I tend to take my creatine either post-workout or away from any caffeine. Mm. But do I use creatine all the time? No, I use it when I've got it. Do you put it in a shake or anything like that? Yeah. 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 You, no, I was just asking because some people out there, right they, yeah. I know a lot of people always ask me like when to take it, what to take yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people it, ask And a lot of people do it a lot of different ways. And I yeah. think I think the key thing is just getting it into your system. Yeah, Again, if, if it's away from caffeine or yeah. whatever, yeah. but yeah. just the main thing is to get that five grams a day yeah, if yeah. you're a man into I've your always, system daily. I've yeah. always done I've always done a loading phase, but that's just because I'm an impatient fuck, basically. Yeah, yeah. But then, yeah, I just literally stick it in my, uh, it literally goes into my morning, my breakfast shake. That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's, fi that's fine. So you can put it post-workout, you can put it, whatever. And, and guys, like, like we said, like this is not, this is, we're talking top percent again of, uh, Tip of the iceberg. Yeah, yeah. Not, yeah, tip of the iceberg, probably top, you know, after 80% of, of getting your nutrition, yeah. nutrition, you're training, you know, you're this, you're that right first, then we can start implementing stuff like creatine. Mm. Like that's when you'd want to start implementing things like that. And if you're really rigid and consistent with your training as it's, well. It's the finer details of, of when you get to that certain point. Yeah. You know, it's like people that say that they want to do like steroids when they've been at the gym for two months. It's like, yeah, yeah. no, go go and get to your physical peak, do all these things, and then maybe consider going on some testosterone. Yeah, yeah. And also consider doing testosterone if you get on stage. Like, let's let's be honest. Like, you know, a lot of people want to start doing stuff like that. Unless, you, again, if you're doing sort of TRT, that's a different matter, as we've we've probably spoke about before. But in regards to um, actual usage of that, like, what are your goals? Like, what do you actually want? Do you, you know, I want to look a bit bigger. I want to look, well, let's do it. Yeah, it might take you a bit longer, but you're going to sustain it as well. You can't sustain doing that sort of thing for years and years and years. And actually you're here like for your most prized asset, which is your health. Your most prized asset is your health. And funnily enough, I, I seen a guy driving, um, driving a McLaren as I was on my way down here mm -hmm. and he was well overweight. And I thought, yeah, he's got all the money in the world, but he hasn't got one thing. And that's his prized asset, which is his health. Mm -hmm. And it, make, it makes you consider that, doesn't it? And yeah. you think to yourself, you think, fuck me, I'm working so hard doing this, doing that, putting this in place that I haven't actually taken time for myself. I think that's so important for people to actually consider because it makes such a difference. I say that to people all the time. A few people I've trained over the years, they've been quite successful businessmen and stuff like that. And they, they tend to spend maybe like from 45 to maybe like 55, 60, getting this really successful business. But as they're doing that, their their sole focus is on that. They end up getting to fifty five, sixty, and they're in such bad shape, you know. And then and then they're only you know they're only a couple of McDonald's away from a heart attack, really. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> do yeah, you know what I mean? And absolutely. I say to them like, they're, but they're at a point where they can still change it, mm -hmm. you know. At that fifty five sort of age, you know, if you're still there at sixty five, you know, you've done well probably not to have an heart attack if you're that overweight, yeah, you know. Absolutely. And um, I think that's yeah, it's a massively good point because people do need to take. And you know what? What tends to happen as well is people focus on the business and they don't focus on their health and nutrition however in the actual mid to long term your business would improve if you actually had your health about you anyway oh, yeah. so people go oh yeah but i'm so fucking busy at work it's like yeah i'm running this business i'm running that business like i run three businesses i've got three kids like you have to you have to start taking care of yourself to be able to actually progress 
the business more. Like in the short term, don't get me wrong, you get shit that turns up, you get this and that that needs to happen for the business. However, however, actually the quality and the health of the business is probably going to mirror the health of, the, of yourself as well. Um, unless you get to the point of where some people will be watching this going, well, I don't actually run, I've built the business now. Yeah. Um, but it's like, well, now is the time you just need to start focusing on your health yeah. because that's your most prized asset. Rich, richest man in the graveyard. Yeah. yeah. Is, is a big, Absolutely. you know, is a term, isn't it? And, and that's it. Once you get to that point, there's no point earning all this money if you're not around to fucking yeah, yeah. enjoy it, you Absolutely. know? And then, yeah, and we took we went from creatine to to that. I love that. Yeah, yeah that was oh, so it's maybe this, this is us. This is what yeah, we're yeah. doing. I, I spent I spent half this podcast trying to pull the conversation back from with that. Uh, yeah, yeah that's what I was about to say. I've always got like a fucking stupid question that I'll just just <laughs> yeah, throw yeah. at you, mate. But yeah, and yeah. I'm I'm the same. Like you tend to go down sort of like rabbit holes. A lot of stuff leads into other stuff, though, doesn't it? You know, a Absolutely. lot of stuff. You know, I yeah. think, oh, that that's fucking from that. And, and you got to start thinking about like the, you know your viewers, me yourself, whatever else. You start thinking like you know on that level and you just think, well, what's, 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 um, what's actually happening. And you're thinking about, you know, these people that can, oh yeah, but I don't have time to train. I don't have time to do this. I don't have time. Maybe we all have the time for our most valuable prize asset. Like, yeah. and it's about priorities and don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be something where you're doing six sessions a week. It doesn't need to. And this is, again, we're going back to right at the start, but mm. adherence of a plan, yeah. adherence of, and, and get going through the stages and the levels. That's why structure is important. That's why having a PT and having a program or having whatever from a professional for me is the paramount thing that a man or a woman or anyone can do yeah. when they're looking to look at their health. You know, I, the amount of people that I speak to that go, oh yeah, I know, you know, I've been going to gym for years. I know everything. Then you speak to them about any sort of anything in depth. They haven't got a clue. They haven't got a clue. Yeah. Of, and also people can know it. Knowledge is one thing. Um, it's worth fuck all unless you do something with it. Mm -hmm. So you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you're not implementing it, it means nothing. It's actually worse. It's actually worse because you've got the knowledge. Mm -hmm. You're doing fuck all with it. I think it's accountability as well. That's a big one for me. Like, you know, and I, you know, over the years, I've probably had that problem, you know. <clears throat> it's like being, you know, talking to people and saying like, you know, I'm doing this plan or whatever. But if you've not got someone like yourself there going, you haven't lost fucking weight this week. Like what's happened? Yeah. It's so easy to sack it off week to week. And that's yeah, yeah. what I say to people when they're buying a PT or they're buying a fitness professional, they're not just buying like our knowledge, they're buying like our time and our, us to be able to sit, like pull them up on their shit yeah. when they go, turn around and they go, oh, you know, yeah. I had a bad, I had a bad night last night. Well, yeah, I know you've had a bad night, but why didn't you eat your yeah. fucking breakfast? Same. Why have you, why have you gone out and had a McDonald's instead? Yeah. It's, it's not going to change anything. Do you know, I, I, I do want to get into sort of barriers uh, and, and the common barriers and how you overcome that. Before we do that, I, I also want to just, because um, we've talked about obviously intake of calories and you touched on BMR and basal metabolic rate earlier. It'd be good just to cover off a little bit about expenditure of calories. And, and not necessarily training, but Danny mentioned neat earlier, yeah. which probably means nothing to most people. So yeah. it'd be good just to chat through, I guess, someone's total daily energy expenditure yeah. and and what will what makes up that. What compromises it, yeah, okay. And what compromises it. Um, so what makes up our TDE, so we've got your BMR, basal metabolic rate, which is usually the highest contributor, usually. We'll cover that in a second. Your neat, your eat, I will cover that in a second. And your TEF. So thermic effect of food, we've already spoke about. Your eat is your exercise activity. So how many calories you burn from conscious, conscious activity, not subconscious, conscious activity. And your neat, what you're doing, which is your non-exercise activity, what you're doing subconsciously to burn calories, which tends to be our second biggest contributor. And this is a huge thing that people need to consider if they're trying to lose weight, is actually their neat-based calories. How many calories they're burning just from doing day-to-day -day activity. So when we spoke about the postman, who job is to do 25,000 steps per day, like he's gonna burn loads more calories. So his neat's gonna be through the fucking roof. So you can get away with pushing calories way higher. So some people might be on 4,000 calories. And so, hey, mate, mate, he's the same weight as me though. And I'm, you know, I'm on 1,800 and he's on 3,800. What's going on? Yeah, but your admin base, like your day-to-day -day activity is way lower. And that's that plays a huge role in, in the deficit. And the issue is when we diet for a long period of time, and I talk about this a lot in terms of metabolic consequences, because your body's smart. If you start to drop your calories super, super low, your neat will take a huge hit. Mm. 
and literally you will see it in people's demeanor, their actions. That literally, it'll be sat here, like it's like fuck, I'm fucking naked. <laughs> like that's what happens when you start dropping calories down. Your body will adjust. So by having an extra, let me just give you an example. So say say if you're on fourteen hundred calories, by having an extra four hundred calories, you're probably going to be in almost a similar deficit. Mm. And I know people are going, well, hang on a minute, because you're going to do more. You're neat the amount of neat calories that you're going to actually burn is going to be greater. And you're probably nearly going to make up that 400 calories just by day-to-day -day activities because you're not fucking in a, you know, in a, in the hurt locker every single day from eating 12, 1400, 1500 calories, you know? It's a really good point that you've made there because a lot of people, when they, they go in into a big deficit, they hear about this starvation mode and that your, your metabolism just slows right down. And often yeah. it is just that, isn't it? Exactly as you yeah. said, it's, it's the You need. just do way less. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, it's your movement yeah. that reduces. And what tends to happen, if you start under-consuming calories on a, on a severe level, on a starvation level yeah. like that, because at the end of the day, dieting is just, you know, controlled starvation. Yeah. And the more you can control it, the better. However, if you start going really strict and aggressive with it, you're going to lose lean tissue, which is going to have a effect on your basal metabolic rate because you're going to lose lean tissue. So when you, when you stop doing the diet, when you stop doing the diet, yeah, and you've lost two stone, three stone, whatever, right? Metabolically, you will be in a worse position because you've lost lean tissue, which means your BMR is going to be lower. So the next time you binge, you're actually going to put on more weight than the last time you binged. And most people go, oh, it's because I'm getting older. It's because of this, because of... no, no, it's because you're dieting like a fucking arsehole. You've lost a bit of lean tissue there as well, which has compromised your your BMR. And now your body can't process as many calories as what it used to before. So can you just quickly explain what BMR is and that it's not the same thing as a BMI? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so all right, because I get that all the fucking yeah, time. Yeah, they're, they're going, no, I'm a BMI. But no, yeah. yeah. Basal metabolic so, rate is very different. Yeah. To, so your basal metabolic rate, rate is is like what we burn on a day-to-day -day basis, coma state calories without any activity. So You could lay in bed. Yeah. So And you can you can estimate, this is what I do with all my, so I go through all the questionnaires. I do that. I don't have any team members do that. I, I've got 10 coaches. I go through all of my questionnaires myself and I give all the calories out and I go through all their, because I'm literally like fucking anal with BMR, with TDA, everything like that. So I'll go through all that and go, right, this person needs this calories. And don't get me wrong, Sometimes I, I would say most of ninety five percent of the time I'm bang on it, but sometimes you may. But it's you. The only time I would get it incorrect is when they've given me incorrect data. Mm. So they go, "Oh yeah, I'm, I only do three thousand steps a day." But then the start of the course, I really motivate, and they're doing fucking fifteen thousand steps a day. And I'll be like, "Well, hang on a minute. Like, there's no, no there's no, no no wonder you're losing six pound a week mm. yeah. because you're also under your calories and also you're motivated. Fuck, you're training every day and also you're hitting, hitting way more steps. But what I'm trying to say with your BMR is we can estimate this to a very close amount by your body weight, mm. by your body weight. Mm. So but a lot of people go, oh, you know, yeah, but people are different. Yes, they are. If you're holding more lean tissue, then your BMRs. So uh, for example, someone who's 90 kilos, who's holding quite a lot of lean tissue and someone who's 90 kilos, who's higher percentage of body fat, their BMRs are going to be different because obviously this person's got more lean tissue. It's going to be more with the person who's got more lean tissue, obviously. However... Um, for your general average person who's say between 10 and 30% body fat, like it ain't going to change. It ain't going to change that much. I think it's yeah. not, it's, it's never. Like maybe, might be 10 like... maximum. And if, that's if you've got someone who's heavily muscled, maybe 20% more. So say if someone's BMR is 2000 calories, that person might be 2400 calories. Their BMR, what they're going to burn at rest. What they're going to burn just doing fuck all. Now this can get, as we start to diet, aggressively, obviously you can lose lean, lose lean tissue, which affects your BMR. And then the next time they binge, like I said, then they put all the weight back on quicker than what they did before. And this is where you get the yo-yo dieting. And every time they do the yo-yo dieting, every time they go into the deficit next time, they probably go lower and harsher because they find it harder to lose the weight because BMR, they're in a worse position with their BMR. This is why weight training is super important or not just weight training, stimulation of muscles. So people train at home going, well, I don't want to weight train. Mate, if you're doing squats and lunges, that's still stimulating the muscles. Yeah. That's still activating the muscles. That's still going to protect them if you're eating a reasonable amount of protein. That's still going to protect, you know, th those systems mm -hmm. and, and your BMR when you're going into those, you know. So for your, for your BMR, 
is there like a quick way to calculate your BMR? Paul showed me a little way years ago, years ago, and I've always used it just as a quick calculator. I know they have calculators online. Well, that's it. I think there's tons online, but the, the, the one that Danny's referring to is literally, I find this is so close. If you use like obviously Harris Benedict in um, Cunning, Cunningham, this one is so close to both of those. It's literally, if you're male, take your body weight in kilos and times it by 24. If you're female, times it by 22. And that gives you a, a, a yep. fairly close BMR. Yep. It's I've I've checked it against both yeah. of those, and it is yeah. it's, it's 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 really really. Close. So I got that I got that from Martin McDonald. If you if you know yeah, him, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mac Nutrition, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that's bang on, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, the way I would look at it is around those percentages between twenty and twenty five percent. And I always look at if I know the individual. <laughs> Oh, yeah, cool. If I know the individual um, and I know they're a bit more heavily muscled, I will lean towards a higher percentage, uh, the higher um, rate of 25, maybe potentially higher. Um, whereas if I don't, you, the issue is what we have with the industry is a lot of people are psychologically affected by a certain amount of calories when you give it to them. So we have to take that into consideration um, when dealing out those sort of things. But in regards to TDE, like that's going to be the main contributor is your BMR. So say if someone's on, you know, their total daily energy expenditure is 3,000 calories and they're a 90 kilo bloke, mm -hmm. you know, their BMR is probably going to be higher than, or around the 2,000 calorie mark. Let's just be honest. Like it's going to be around the 2,000 calorie mark. Yeah, without me using the figures that you use, it's going to be around the 2,000 calorie mark. That's before they move a fucking finger. That's before they lift a spoon to their face. That's before they blink a fucking eyelid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's 2,000 calories. Yeah. yeah? And your total daily energy expenditure is 3,000. So say you're neat, you're probably looking at it between, again, depending on what the person's doing on a day-to-day, -day, but you're probably looking, and this can be, it's a huge gray area, a huge gray area neat, because some person could be doing so, so much that their neat calories, you know, are 1,500, 2,000 calories. Yeah, and it's not, as, it's not even just that, that actual kind of movement. It's also just if you're a anxious person you're fidgeting non-stop yeah, yeah. that that equates to neat as well yeah, right absolutely and what tends to happen as well is when you do a reverse dieting process correctly and you focus on going through that progressive phase is people just do fucking more <laughs> people just do more when they when they start having more calories in a controlled fashion you start bringing them in slowly and metabolic rate will 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 increase but also neat will increase so they can deal with more calories and they'll be like when i was in a deficit i was on 2200 calories now um apparently in a surplus, but I'm on 4,000 calories. Why have I not gained weight? Mm -hmm. You've not gained weight because before you weren't doing as much because obviously you've gone through that metabolic consequence of going into a diet. But now, because you've got probably at a, an adaptive metabolic rate anyway, this can change from person to person. And usually it tends to be on previous dieting methods. So when people have done like really harsh dieting methods for years mm -hmm. on end, your metabolic adaptation and how you're going to respond to higher calories is going to be slower because your body's in almost like, hang on a minute. I've been through this shit numerous times <laughs> and very frequently and not that long ago. So that's where you need to probably be a bit more slower on that reverse dieting process and a bit more progressive phase. Whereas somebody who's a bit more, um, a bit more sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not adaptive, but responsive mm. to it is going to respond better to higher calories quicker. Yeah. Um, and you'll see that in their demeanor and what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. You see it all the time. When I had clients that were competing on, um, even though his body fat levels were really low, he was still on, you know, reasonably high calories, probably at 2.7. He was quite a tall guy, uh, not stupidly heavy muscled, but he was on about 2.7. He's dying all the time. I'm starving. I'm so hungry. Hey, mate, you're on 2,700 calories. But because he's, because all the signals are still getting sent to the, the brain saying you're really fucking lean though as well, mate. And you're still in a deficit, even though it's not a huge deficit, you're still in a deficit. But then as soon as he finished that dieting phase and competed and afterwards, we did a little progressive reverse dieting. Mate, his, we got him up to like four and a half thousand calories and he'd be like running in the gym, you know, playing squash in his breaks. <laughs> Whereas before he'd be fucking sat in the office, literally like that, you know, and this mm. is, that's the, that's the neat component. It plays such a huge role. And then when we talk about eat, this is the calories we burn on a exercise basis. And when we're talking about, you know, oh yeah, but I've just banged in a 600 calorie session. Uh, is that going to be more beneficial than a 400 calorie session? Well, yeah, kind of, but it depends on how you feel the next days and what you're going to do and actually what you can commit to. Um, with the eat side of things, you're probably looking between 10 to 20% max of calories. Like, yeah, depend again, you start talking to people that are doing 
Ironmans and triathlons, that's going to change. So don't jump down my throat if you think, oh yeah, but I'm doing an Ironman. My eat calories are 50%. Yeah, they probably are because you're training for four hours a day. Yeah. We, we mentioned earlier about how difficult it is to kind of understand the amount of calorie expenditure through exercise, but you do include that in the total daily energy expenditure when you do your calculations. Yeah. So when they, yeah, when, okay. when if it depends on their goal. Yeah. So I'll say, I'll look at their, their weight, their height, that plays a role as well. And what they do on a day-to-day basis. And I'll work out the calories from there, depending on what their goals are. So, yeah, I want to lose a bit of body fat, you know, or I want to lose quite a lot of body fat, um, maintain lean tissue, want to look good on the beach, whatever. Then I'll, I'll create that in regards to that's taken into account all of their activity. Mm-hmm. And then we massage it either way. Mm-hmm. So you go, right, okay, after first couple of check-ins, they're likely going to lose quite a lot of water weight initially on the first week or two anyway. So I'll be like, oh my God, I've lost five pounds this week. It's like, yeah, you have lost five pounds, probably not five pounds of fat, but you've lost five pounds but you're going to get, it's going to slow down. What I tend to work on a basis point that can change, but a really good basis point is if you can lose a percent of your body weight on a weekly basis, blokes are going to respond really well to that. Like women, it's going to be a bit more fluctuations going on. Don't get me wrong, blokes are going to have fluctuations, especially with different qualities of foods going in. However, they tend to be a bit more consistent with their weight losses. And if you can lose around 1% of your body weight per week, you're dieting to to a good level. And what that means is you're not going too strict with it and also you're still getting good results. So say if you're a 100 kilo bloke, if you're losing a kilo a week because that's 1% of your body weight, that's 2.2 pounds. Most people would be like, oh, that's not that much. You do that for 10 weeks, that's a lot. That's 10% of your body weight. weight. That's a lot of fucking body weight. And the stats out there show that people that lose any more than 10% of their body weight, like 90 plus percent of them put it all back on and more again. So you're still losing a decent amount of weight doing that. Yeah, I was literally about to ask you what the the ideal amount of weight is each week for somebody. Yeah, yeah. you just kind of covered it. So that's, that's cool. I would say between, again, it depends on how lean an individual is. Yeah. So if they're leaner, you actually should probably go down towards a 0.5% yeah. uh, of body weight per week mm-hmm. um, and can actually be lower if they're super, super lean. Um, and you can go higher than 1%, don't get me wrong. Like you're going to have weeks where they do lose more than 1%, but on average over the 10 weeks, like what I always say to people is like, you know, yes, you lost two stone doing this method. Yes, you've only lost a stone doing my method, but there's a fucking damn sight guarantee or likelihood that you'll keep that weight off. Mm. And that's what you're here for, right? You're not here, just here to, to lose two stone, yeah. put two, two and a half back on. Yeah. You're here to lose it. And what's the rush? Like it's only 10 weeks. Like you've been eating shit for three years. Like you can't just go 10 weeks. I'm going to be back to my peak fitness. Like it's not going to happen. You've got to, you've got to buy into it long-term health. Like I said, main priority and most valuable asset. Like let's focus on it for a year. Like your guy who lost 10 stone, didn't do it in 10 weeks. No, took didn't two, do it. Two years. Yeah. Which is still incredible progress. I bet huge. He, he tried diet on his own for a couple of years and he lost, I think he lost two stone on his own over three, three years, maybe or something like that. And then doing this me. sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then come to me and then he just, he just consistent. That's the only yeah. thing I'd say with him. He just, I give him something, he go away and you just, yeah, it's tight. And it was just so, so easy. And this is where we, we talk about different clients and different people that you're dealing with on a day-to-day basis. And, and as a coach, it's our job to try, like a lot of people go point the finger saying, oh, well, the client's not sticking to it. It's like, there's a reason why the client's not sticking to it. And that's down to the coach's protocols. Mm-hmm. I think well. that'll motivate people. Yeah, yeah you've, got to get, you've got to have the motivation. Obviously the motivation is going to come and go no matter what's going on. And it's about trying to instill habits yeah. and disciplines and also understanding what the client's going through as well in the, in terms of their life and, and, and putting, putting the foot on the gas when you can put the foot on the gas and also letting it off the gas and, and understanding from a coach's perspective, we may have to do a week's maintenance here. Yeah. I, I, I do that with my clients all the time. I'll say so sometimes they're going through something or they're going, they come in and they're not feeling great and they're not at that well. Blah, blah. I'm like, it's all right. It's actually okay. Like we're not, it's not the end of the world. Like let's just get back on track. We'll have a little bit of a lighter session today. Mm-hmm. And then when they're in on Friday, then we, we ramp it up a bit. And I do that. And I think that's what a lot of PTs get wrong. Yeah. They don't actually, they look at people sometimes as like robots. Oh, you're paying me the money and I've got to fucking kill you every time you come in the gym. And it's not about that. It's, it, it's a journey, isn't it? It's a journey over, over. And a, a journey time. on any journey. That's why we always call it a health and fitness journey is going to have ups and downs. Yeah. 100%. Any journey. Like you're going to get certain clients that do stick to protocols. I get, I have it numerous times, mainly blokes from honest who I give them targets, give them feedback from their week and they go ahead and do it again, do it again. But what they tend to miss when they're not on course or, um, they're not, you know, p- 
paying a coach, and we spoke about this on the break a minute ago, is the accountability and also the set targets because they just need that sort of rhythm and, and, that, and, that, and that focus point going, right, he's doing that. Like somebody says, oh, yeah, yeah, but I can do that myself now. So many people, so many clients do that. I can do it myself. And then they do go backwards. Mm-hmm. They, do, they do go backwards. What tends to happen is like, mate, it's a service. Um, I know I can fucking clean my windows, but I don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, know someone's, <laughs> no. I know someone's got better tools than me to do it. And he's better than me at doing it. He's more experienced than me to do it. So I'd rather pay him to do that job because that releases me to do other things. And that's almost what a PT service needs to be. Now, as we spoke about before the break is, you know, um, the issue with the industry is there's so many cowboys out there. There's so many serial packet PTs out there that do like a fucking four week course and then start saying, you know, I'm an online coach. So yeah, well, a lot of them is not even PTs. I've talked to this, yeah, yeah. this about- You yeah, mentioned uh, it a while yeah. back, didn't we? Yeah, yeah they, they got these coaches online that are just, just bodybuilders or- X, you know, X this or X that, and they've been shown a way to do something and they've got a really good physique and then they come in and they look at it and they, then they're regurgitating that information to people and people are looking at their physiques and going, yeah, they must know what they're on about. Yeah. yeah. yeah they, they give get the same it. diet to every single person. Exactly. And then, um, and then, and then when that doesn't work, they haven't got a plan B, they haven't got anything. Yeah, yeah. And then they come to someone like us who, who's been around for a while and then they come to us and they're really skeptical, you know, because they've had this yeah, fucking shit before, experience yeah. with someone else. I, I've had I've had clients literally break down in tears because of the experience they've had with, with other trainers. Yeah, it's, yeah it's mad. It's it, yeah, people I think sometimes have a lot riding on the outcome of of yes. of this investment. Yeah. And when it goes tits up, yeah. it can really impact them. You get umbrella and that's the yeah. tough part about it, and it's worse online. One to one's not too bad. Well, it's way worse online. Well, you get found so out. Much. You get found out one to one very quickly. I think yeah. if 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 you if you are if you don't know what you're on about and someone's asking you directly and you don't know what neat is, you don't know what this is, you don't know what that is. That you go, oh, you know that. Whereas online coaching, they can just you know a bit of research. Oh yeah, they can give an answer. Does that make sense? And I think that's that's where the little difference is yeah, with yeah, that yeah, type I, of stuff. You yeah, know what I mean? I agree. I agree with that definitely. Um, but I would also say like. You know, there's so many people, like you said, going online that are doing a lot of things and that's great. But also we have to consider like, it's also, you know, some of the protocols that are going on um, are fucking stupid. <laughs> and, you yeah. know, people eating, you know, you know, guys eating 16, 1500 calories doing two hours of, of, of training a day, whether you're doing a competition or not, that is not needed. That is, that is not needed. That's down to you as a coach to give the client more time to put it, potentially get in shape. And that should be you as a coach rather than just go, oh yeah, it's, it's money in the back pocket. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, no, no. Like, let's focus on what the client's goals are. And when you get them there, that will all happen anyway. Mm-hmm. All, that, all the other secondary bits will happen anyway. Let's focus on the result of the client and actually not fuck them up physically and mentally. Um, but yeah, you have, you know, you see it all the time and um, it is frustrating. I said to you in the break, I think we need to, um, I think as a, as a nation, they need to uh, legitimize personal training and make it a university course. And I've said this, I think I may have said it to you, but I said it in the break. Like if we legitimized it, we'd get rid of a lot of these fucking cowboys, you know, we get, because they, they wouldn't, see that through yeah I, I think that the risk with that though is you would also lose some really good trainers because yes. not everybody will invest the money and time for a degree yeah. but what you need is is someone like a reps or a sims bar they're fucking up their game a little bit yeah. and really regulate it you know a couple of my coaches that work on p10 um are more experience based than qualification based mm-hmm. and they're some of my best coaches yeah. um the reason being is because they understand people they're very personable um, but they've also been coached the right way through the systems I've used. Yeah. So don't get me wrong. Like there's some questions around loosening threshold that they're just going to go Pete or <laughs> Alice, yeah. who's the nutritionist. Yeah. Like that, that's, that's why it's good to have a team because you can't just be Jack of all trades. You need to have people that are good at certain things. Um, however, if you're going with somebody who's not got any qualifications, you better fucking hope that they are highly invested in you and your journey. Like, because like they're, they're basing it all on a, a lot of experience and also passion mm-hmm. for the industry. And that's what I always say to coaches, like, like, if you're not passionate about helping people, just don't do it. Just don't, you're, you're, you're here to make money. Like you can only sh- sell shit once. That's it. You can only sell shit once. That's, that's you out the game. So if you're not passionate about doing it, mm-hmm. then don't forget about it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely right. When I was, when I was working in the gym space more and I was, I, I spent a period of time where I was recruiting PTs and I saw hundreds coming through and most of them just come in because they like training. 
they they, yeah. they want to be a PT because they like training. And it, to your point, it was exactly that. Like you ain't got any people skills, mate. You don't even like people. But yeah, you yeah, like yeah. trainings, you want to be a PT. It's yeah, the wrong yeah. job, ain't out. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you said to me how many you've had over oh, the years. Oh, mate, unbelievable. Mate. You, you won't believe the shit that comes through. Yeah, I can imagine. But, but we also look back, and don't get me wrong, I've, I've, you know, through my PT career, like I started PT when I was in my early 20s on the gym floor. And there's things that I look back at now and thinking, fuck me. Like, if I'd have, I'd have been, you know, I was banging in, we were talking about this again on the break. I was banging in 40, 50 sessions, PT sessions every single week, week on week, week on week. And, you know, going through burnout, but because, you know, you love what you do, you, yeah. you continue to do it. However, some of the things that I used to do, I think, why has that client gone to mate boy and not me? And then, and then you eventually realize that later down the line. Why? Because you maybe stood there, like it's, it's, you've got a tight t-shirt on with your arms crossed. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's a not, professional it's journey though, isn't it? Like personal training is, is, is a journey. You learn and you pick up information and you, if you choose to use that information, if you go like, I tend to, if someone says something to me and I think, oh, that's, that's good. I've never really heard that before. I'll go away. I'll research it. I'll just, just, just research it, see if there's any data to back it up. And then if it's shit, I'll just, yeah, all right, that's shit. If it's good, I'll keep it. You know, and I'll put it in my back pocket and then on my next client, I'll be like, oh, you know, we'll implement this into yeah, it. Yeah, that's how you learn you know? as an individual, for sure. Like, you can't just be the perfect PT. But some people are Straight egotistical yeah. and they think they know everything. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and you will go through the phases of that yourself. Like, I've, I've you know, when I was one-to-one -one PT and you, you sort of think, oh, you know, you, you know it all. And it's like, when you look back and you think, fuck me, like, actually, I knew fuck all, really. Yeah, it's like, a yes, I was getting all, results. I was getting results. But some of the times we were getting results was because people were just doing it with, with willpower. Yeah and stick into my protocols. Mm -hmm. And then when you actually start taking people to, and you start talking on a more broader level of getting results with a lot of people, like anybody, right, listen to this, any, any PT and any person can get great results with one or two people and they'll put it all over their fucking social. Oh, look at this fucking results. I've got fucking amazing results. Yeah, that's because he stuck to the chicken broccoli rice. Anybody can do that. Anybody's going to get lean doing that. They're not going to win bodybuilding shows by doing that, but they're going to get lean. And they're going to lose a lot of weight. And they're going to fucking say, yeah, it worked for me. But what about the other 95% of people that didn't get results? That's because the methods were too strict and they couldn't adhere to it long term. But people will only see, people won't post about fucking 95% of people that didn't get results. The issue is, is there's no sustainability of that business because people won't, won't continue to work with that person because you're only getting 5% who can actually stick to it. And I, I think you're exactly right. Like, obviously, with my with my clients, I've had exactly the same. I just make sure that I'm, I'm in a bit of a weird situation where I'm full all the time. I don't like to do too much social social media stuff now. Main reason is I'm full. We realize you're on a podcast, mate, right? Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is, is with my client base, I don't put a lot of like yeah. you know transformations and stuff like that out anymore because when I do, you get like a lot of interest, and then I was ending up being like, you know, they go, oh, can we can we start with you, brother? No, sorry, I'm full. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm full. And then yeah. it just become like people would get more pissed off with me, or I was doing a waiting list, and then people would message me like two months later, going, "Oh, have you got space yet?" And yeah, I'm like, yeah, "Oh, yeah. sorry, I'm still not yeah, got yeah, space." Yeah. But what what that tends then, to happen from a business perspective, what would happen here is is just putting systems in place. Um, but then then you've got to put those systems in place to release yourself to do those, or you put somebody else in control. Of working marketing. on your business rather than in your yeah, business. and and you put somebody else in control of marketing. Like I'm the sort of person like I've got a business coach and. Um, you know, he's trying to potentially pull me out of doing check-ins, but I love doing check-ins. Mm -hmm. So I want to continue to do what I do whilst, you know, pushing other things that I don't like doing, like social, and I don't do much on social media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though we've got four or 500 clients per course, I don't do that much on social media and I should do more, but then I've got to delegate that out more. And that's down to me as a business owner to be able to do that. And, and having the balls, and this is the first, the hardest part is taking on your first trainer right, and going through that, going through that. And I'm sure guys that are watching this, this podcast that run their own business, taking on your first staff member, taking on your 10th staff member, whatever, like, and the most issues you will have with, is with your team. Like they're the, they're the biggest issues that you will have, but also they're also going to, you know, complement what you do as well. Yeah. So, you know, you need to weigh it up and don't get me wrong. You've got to invest in the right people and you've got to bring in the right people. Like you said about, mm. you know, um, you know, going through all the PTs, yeah. you've got to bring the right people into the environment. Because you might have somebody who's fucking really knowledgeable. I used to know a PT who was so knowledgeable, yeah. but they were so cold. Yeah. And like, so like, like when, so, you know, when walk, someone walks into the room and they're just fucking, everyone's just like, oh, like, <laughs> like that. And it's not just down to the knowledge base. It was just down to that, but the you, environment. You've you got to that spend that, that time with that person for an hour, say at a time. Yeah. 
and I know I'm not paying any money to be with someone for an hour if I don't fucking like them. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, so true. So true. Um, we said we were going to talk about some of the barriers. People are on a little bit of a tangent. Yeah, and I yeah, do want yeah. to hear a little bit more about your programme, actually. So we'll come on to that just towards the end in a second. Before we do that, um, we've talked loads about, obviously, the fundamentals, the pyramids, about, you know, what you're consuming and what's important. We've talked a bit about energy expenditure around total daily energy expenditure and what makes that up. Um, you also touched on a few times about the psychology and and that type of stuff. So I'm curious, just working with so many sort of busy parents, professionals, what are like the key, ba- or the, the, not the key, the main barriers that you tend to come across yeah. and how have you overcome some of those? Okay, so first of all, most people are going to say about the time, aren't they? They say, look, I don't have time to do this, don't have time to do that. The issue is, what I always say to clients initially is, and this is a process again about coaching people because at the end of the day, that's what they're there for. They're not just there for, to get feedback and targets. You've got to coach the individual to try and create habits and routines and disciplines Um, is yes, you're going to have excuses to not do the work. You're always going to have excuses to not do the work, but your, your excuses to do the work should be more powerful and should be bigger than the excuses to not do the work. Now, what I'm trying to say here is, oh, people go, well, hang on a minute. Like, should I sack off doing what I do from from business that's putting food on the table? No, you shouldn't because obviously that's putting the food on the table. But what we can come up with is a happy medium. Like you just got to remember, like you're probably, if you're in that position where you're giving that, I ain't got no time, I haven't got, you know, no energy, I haven't got this, I haven't got that. Then it's that building process and going, right, okay, let's stick to, let's commit to two sessions per week. Like here's the two sessions I would like you to commit to. And initially getting the ball rolling is probably the hardest part. But as soon as you fucking get it rolling, it's a damn sight easier. And that momentum building, and that actually creates the motivation. You yourself will create the motivation. Like you, people will get like this extrinsic motivation from seeing a transformation picture. But actually keeping the ball rolling, that's what's going to keep that intrinsic motivation going and seeing the results that they're getting, getting more energy. What I always say to people after three weeks, is not about their weight loss. After three weeks of eating better quality foods, how do you feel? How do you feel? Oh, I feel way better. I feel like I've got way more energy. Right. Don't forget how you felt three weeks ago. Because yeah. you felt like shit. You came in here, you were tired, you had no energy, you had no get up and go. But now we're training two, three times per week. Um, you're eating better quality food. Yes, we're still in deficit, but funnily enough, you got more energy because you're eating the right types of food. You're actually getting blood flow going around the body. My relationship's getting better. My business is getting better. All these little wins. This is what we always talk about within our check-ins as well. It's not just about... Right, last week's weight, this week's weight, fucking target weight, target calories, training. We talk about lifestyle. We talk about, right, what's your biggest one of the week? What are your confidence levels at? What's your energy levels at? And then when you look and reflect from what they did at the start and they did at the end, I go, right, at the start, you said your energy levels were two, yeah? Now they're seven, right? That has also progressed you in this area, this area, this area. And that's, that's huge. And what we, when you talk, start talking about barriers, we can talk about kids, we can talk about, you know, all these other things that, that probably a lot of the viewers have or listeners have um, in, regards to, in, in regards to barriers. But at the end of the day, it doesn't need to be the perfect split. Like so many people get caught up with, oh, fuck me, I, I should be training every day. Sometimes as ourselves, as PTs, you, you sort of do that yourself as well. Like, fuck me, I should be training five times a week. I should be training a bit harder here and there. Yeah, absolutely, sometimes. But also, you're still turning up and getting the sessions in. If you want to take it to the next level, yes, you have to go through those threshold points. And you have to go through a bit of pain to see progress, don't you? Yeah. With, with anything in your life. Like whether it's training, whether it's nutrition, sometimes you're going to have to go through a bit of pain. And that doesn't mean physical pain, like it might be psychological pain. Of, of saying no, of going, right, okay, I really don't like training in the evenings, but at the minute, it's my only option. So I'm going to commit two evenings a week instead of watching fucking Netflix all week, all week. I know it's easy doing that, but also you can still do that the other five days of the week. Let's do the other, let's do the two days for you. Yeah. And give me one hour. We'll give you, and one hour, I'm not asking you to train for that one hour. That's getting there, doing half an hour and getting back. That's if you're going to the gym. If you're doing it at home, 35 minutes. That's fucking pissy. Here with a shower, 45 minutes, you're done. Yeah, let's commit to two sessions per week. And then we build on that. When they, when they start seeing the value of that and they start getting more energy from doing that, what I would say if people are super, super busy, super busy is training earlier will be, will be more beneficial. You'll find it easier if you're training earlier because it's in the bank. When you get to 8 p.m., things will crop up with business, with life and stuff. And you're like, fuck me, I've got to be on the laptop. 
I find that quite a lot of the time, like I'm doing stuff in the evening. So I try and get it in early because then it's in the bank. And what tends to happen, and if you've got, you know, you guys have got kids as well, is is you have to be strict with your bedtime as well. If you're, if you're going to bed at 12 o'clock and you're waking up and you think, fuck me, I've got no energy. Like there's no surprise why you've got no energy. You've got three fucking kids or whatever and you're going to bed at midnight because mm. you're watching Netflix for three hours. Like you need to set rules and go, right, okay, I'm going to bed at 10. Like that's, that's the time I'm going to bed. And then you'll probably get up earlier anyway to get the sessions in anyway or get one or two sessions in per week. And if you can keep that consistent and then you start building on that, like what we talk about on courses, say if someone's doing two sessions per week, if they can eventually get up to three sessions per week, they can get another 50% done just by adding one more session in. Mm. So over the course, you do two sessions per week. That's 20, that's 20 sessions over 10 weeks. Can we go to three sessions per week? That's 30 sessions. That's going to be a lot more, a lot more volume, a lot more results you're going to get. And also we can actually increase your calories, which is going to keep you happier anyway. So, so yeah, in, in, in regards to barriers, we've all got so many barriers with business, with kids and whatever else, but what I would say is it doesn't, it doesn't have to be the perfect split. You don't have to go cold turkey with everything. You don't have to go like super strict. I know that's some, somehow like how people respond. They like go from eating complete shit to going, no, no, enough's enough. But enough's enough. You're still going to get world-class results from eating good family-friendly meals that factor into your life that you don't feel like you're on dieting on. Um, you're still going to get world-class results by committing to two to three sessions per week rather than six sessions a week doing one week and then going, fuck me, I'm dying here. Can't move, can't fucking walk because I've been doing heavy squats for the first time in six months. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, that all needs to be taken into consideration because that people will build it up. People will make their issues bigger than they are. They'll go, fuck me, I can't do this, can't do that. It's like, you don't need to do that. You don't need to train every day. You don't need to eat those calories. You don't need to eat that super, super clean. Let's just take one step at a time and you're still going to get world-class results from doing that. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And and just real quick as well, someone's, I don't know, midway through your program, they have a bit of a wobble, they've plateaued. How do you typically overcome that? Again, it depends on, depends on the client and what they're going through in terms of, you know, so for example, say if they're checking in and they're talking about their lifestyle, you've got to be understanding as a coach and when you've done it for years, like us guys have done it, done it for years, you can't just go in with a one size fits all fucking approach. Like, mate, what the fuck are you doing? Like people, do, you know, especially women, they're, they're going to get a knickers and a twist. If you start calling them out, don't get me wrong, some people need it and you'll know the clients that need it, that need the kick in the ass, mm. that need the fucking accountability and me going, mate, no bullshit approach. Like I tend to be a no bullshit approach on the front, but on the back end, I know how to deal with my clients better. Yeah. It depends on who they are. You'll learn that through the process anyway with dealing with the client. Um, but in regards to having a wobble, what I would say is, mate, what have you achieved over the first four or five weeks? What have you achieved for the first four or five weeks? You've had something on that's made you do the wobble or you've, and mate, you, it's not hard to, it's not hard to, um, to, to, to get that back. Mm -hmm. Like if you have a heavy weekend, this tends to happen with blokes as well. They tend to fall off plan when they have one thing on, one thing happens. Oh, I've got, I've got a weekend off. And then the next week they're like late on a check-in or something because they had that one weekend. It's like, mate, mate, yes, have that weekend. As soon as you come back, they expect you to be like, mate, you need to be on 1,600 calories now because you've eaten fucking 6,000 calories on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. No, no, just get back on track. By the end of the week, I guarantee you've probably maintained from the week before your check-in, maybe slightly heavier by being back to normal protocols of 2,500 calories, say. And then we get the ball rolling again. Like every Something I say to a lot of my clients is, Yes, you're going to have stuff on, but 80% of the time, you should be able to stick to this. Well, yeah, That's how we factor you, in you, lifestyle. Because you plan it around their lifestyle. Yeah, you know? we've yeah. all got stag dues. We've all got fucking shit going on. I've got a stag do next month. That means I'm not going to go on there with a the fucking Tupperware. <laughs> We're getting hammered <laughs> up. That is what it is, but it does not happen every weekend. Do you find as well, I don't know about if it happens with you, but if you have a client, I always say to them, if you fuck up, like say they do, they, have, they fucking break and they have a McDonald's or they have some shit... Don't just ruin your whole day. Yeah. That's a big thing for me. Like they, they, I don't know if, if you've experienced this a lot, but I experienced yeah. this a lot. They end up just having then this fucking crazy day of like 5,000 calories because exactly. they're like McDonald's and they'll have like KFC. But that's because they think they fucked up. Whereas yeah. if you go, if you go. But they can right. save it. If they, if they don't, if they just yeah, yeah. had that McDonald's and then carried on on plan, it, it won't have that mm. much of What I always say with stuff like shit food that you want to say, where we sometimes call it food for the soul rather than shit food, food for the soul, is 
view that as calories, yeah. not as, oh, I fucked my diet up. No, no, you had 900 calories. That, that's all that happened there. Yeah. That's all that happened there. You had 900 calories. Yes, you went 400 over this week. So now, or 400 over today, or 600 over today, or 1,000 over today. All we're going to do now, right, you're on 2,500 calories. All we're going to do now is restrict by 200 calories on the other five days of the week. That's going down to two, three. You're not really going to feel that. And it still allowed you to have that thousand calories. All of a sudden, we've hit those two and a half thousand calories over the six days. And we've still lost so your pound. You haven't fucked up nothing. Mm-hmm. You haven't fucked up nothing. And when you get people to think like that, oh yeah, hang on a minute, like I'm going to view it as calories rather than this, then they get they tend to not um, have that emotional connection with that food source as much. They're still going to have it, but not as much. And then you can train them out of it. What I would say as well is like, um, what tends to happen with clients that are um, you know, heavily binging um, is, and then think of they're not eating that many calories. This is where I always say like, people aren't going to log things like, they might log a McDonald's because, you know, all the calories might be on that, might be on, on that MFP or whatever, but they're not going to log a fish and chips very accurately. Like you'll see this happen a lot. I, I like, tell my clients, if they do do that, not to eat any like shit, like, like fast foods that are like a Chinese or an Indian, because if they can't count the calories, it's really hard to. So I say to them, try and steer them towards yeah. like a bigger chain, you know, yeah, takeaway, yeah, yeah. yeah. just so yeah. they can count so, the yeah. calories. Yeah. yeah, even though then, even even still, just because the chain restaurants put the calories on there, and this is probably going to trigger a few people listening in, is, oh, they said that this carbonara is 650. It's not. <laughs> yeah. It's fucking not. It's the, fucking chef, the chef behind is not weighing everything. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might be when they did it in the, in the lab, putting all a all little bit of this, a little bit of that. But the chef back there is doing this. So let's be honest with ourselves. Let's increase that by 50%. That's what I always say. Let's increase it by 50 So if it says 650 on a chain restaurant, you're probably looking at more like 950, 1,000 calories. Let's be honest. Now, if you're not going to a chain restaurant and you're trying to log accurately, people do this even now that have done 10 courses of program 10. I still get this because they get fixated sometimes with numbers is they'll log a fish and chips for like 700 calories. I'm like... Mate, I a wish. bowl of chicken and rice is 500. <laughs> <laughs> a bowl of chicken and rice is 500. Like a fish and chips, you're probably looking at more like 1,500, potentially more. So what I always say, oh yeah, but how do I track it? Mate, just do a quick ad. Don't, don't overthink it. Just go, just go, mate, it's 1,500 calories. It was what it was. It is what it is. View it as calories, not as, oh, I fucked my diet up. View it as that. It's 1,500 calories. Simple as that. Yes, you're going to hold a bit more water weight the next day because of the quality of the foods and the sodium within it. Wow. Who cares? And then you just plan for the rest of the week and you go, right, okay. Yeah, I went slightly over on that day. Um, I'll just restrict by 200 calories on every other day. No worries. You're on track still. You're still going to get results. You're still going to feel fueled. You're not going over the top. And you know, you, you can say no to yourself as well. What I would say is tracking those things a lot of the time rather than not tracking them actually really helps, even if they're just quick adding because it will give them accountability of going, Rather than fuck it, I'm I'm not I'm not on plan today. I'm just going to do a cheat day. Mm. End up to being six seven thousand plus calories, yeah. which is easily done, especially blokes. Easily done. Oh, we're greedy fuckers, yeah. aren't we? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Easily done. Is let's just let's just log it and to not as accurate as possible because obviously you don't know what's going in, but to a overestimated mm. amount, then you're going to be in a ballpark figure of probably being probably right, maybe even slightly over exaggerating. That's why we say over exaggerate the calories when you don't know what's in it. Yeah. And then we have base points to, to work on the following week. Yeah. No, mate, it's really good advice. Awesome. Um, we'll pop the description of your program, pop the <laughs> links to your program in our description. Um, before we wrap up, mate, tell, tell, tell us about it. What is it? So yeah, it's a 10 week uh, transformation course. Um, we, we go into so much more depth than just the physical change. Like that's the that's the biggest thing. Like people see, you know, I see, and don't get me wrong, that's what you can use for advertising as a as a online coach or as a one to one PT. You use the results. However, it goes so much deeper than the result because that's just a picture. Like you don't know what's happened within that. You don't know how, what's happened after that. Do you? When we see these results online, you don't know what's happened after that. Like that person could have been on twelve hundred calories. Like you know, like of course they're going to get leaner. Mm but they, ha- they went through hell doing it. Um, what, where are they now? A month later. Do you know what I'm saying? So what we try and do on P10 is, is try to co- cover so much around mindset, so much around health, while still getting 
great results with our clients. And, you know, we, yeah, we talk, we talk about the pillars of fitness of, you know, nutrition, training, mindset. Um, and it's just so important that people consider on a more generalized health basis rather than just thinking, I want to get shredded. And, and then going through the consequences afterwards of going through, you know, cowboy methods of actually getting there. Um, but yeah, so that's what, that's what we do. We do 10 week courses. The reason why we don't, I do do monthly coaching as well, but we do 10 week courses. The main reason for being is because on the breaks between courses, we tend to do it in times where there's not the summer holidays on. I have done courses on summer holidays. It's a fucking nightmare. As you probably know when dealing with clients, when you're trying to do courses over Christmas, it's a fucking waste of time. Like people, people are, you know, should be spending time with their family. And if you can create good habits and disciplines in them, you can just go up to maintenance for those times and they can just see it through. They might gain a bit of bit of weight, but because you haven't gone with a really harsh process, they're not likely to oh, massively overconsume because of them being in that, that sort of status beforehand. Um, so we do three courses a year. And the reason why we do that as well is just to progress the course each time. So you'll always look as a, as a good coach, you'll always look at what you can do better. So you'll go, right, okay, I'll get to the start of a course saying, fuck me, I've thought of everything here. And there's always something that crops up. I think, fuck me, that's good. that could make the course better. And I've been doing it five years, doing courses every year, dealing with, you know, we've had more than 4,000 clients on program 10. And you go, right, there's nothing more I can think of here. I've got so many people in, we've, got, we've covered this, we've covered this. And they'll always, clients will always come up with another way of improving and you've got to listen to your clients as well. And that's another thing, like you know, we've just released a, the Program 10 Fitness app um, and I did it like a, a, I was real proud of it and going, oh, this is what we're going to be offering our clients. And the feedback was great, but some of the clients came back and went, oh, um, this would be better. This would be better. So then I've gone back to my app developer and she's gone, ching, ching, ching. However, it's also going to benefit those clients. Mm. And that's what it's about. And, and the, the rest of it as running a business will come, come after as long as you continue to offer results and, and, and good quality coaching. Yeah. And people will see through it. It's a sophisticated industry. Mm-hmm. Like there's not much, there's no many, you know, people go, oh, you know, you know, this person's yo-yo dieting. They don't make, they know a lot about dieting. They just get drawn in with shit. Um, it's a sophisticated um, um, business, uh, sorry, not business, but a sophisticated um, um, industry. industry, sorry, yeah. So, you know, and and actually coaching those people and people will see through it if, you don't, if you're not doing the, the right thing. You know? Yeah, yeah, it could be a fucking mind. And, co- and the, the people that see through it the most is, is good coaches. Yeah. They'll start to see what other people are doing and other people are in play. Yeah, fuck, fuck, fuck me. It's only, it's like a ticking time bomb, isn't it? Yeah. You watch it. Yeah. But sometimes you can't say anything because you, you've got to let the, the client experience that mm-hmm. to understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 100%. Well, guys, check them out. Pete, appreciate yeah. you coming on, mate. Nice see ya. Thank you, buddy. Nice, to, you, nice being here. I hope to do another one with you guys. At 100%, mate, 100%. We'll do a bit, probably a bit more um, specific rather than me just going off on, on tangents. But. Yeah, we're laying the foundation today, mate, but we'll, uh, we'll definitely uh, <laughs> yeah, build awesome. up from there. Legend, thanks, mate. Cheers, mate. Thank you.